Uh, good evening. This is the full board uh, reorganization meeting of the White River Valley Supervisory Union. I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6.04. Is that correct? On the screen, 6.03. Uh, are there any adjustments to the agenda? It's A full meeting tonight. I don't think you have room for adjustments. Marianne, you can't hear us? Got it now. I'll speak up. I'm sorry. I'll use that PE voice. I'm not a horse. <laughs> Looks like you're on your horse. I am on my horse. <laughs> All right. So uh, the only adjustment to the agenda I'm going to have is that I want to use five, move 5.1 five up. And in regards to reorganization of the board before doing uh, signing timekeepers and things of that nature. Is that cool with folks? Getting some thumbs up. Excellent. 5.1, elected chairperson of the board. Is there a motion for a chairperson to the board? I'd like to make a motion. This is Sarah Root. Yes. I would like to nominate Kathy Galuzzo as chair of the board. This is this is Sue from FBUD. I would second that. Okay. Discussion or other motion? Move to close nominations. Is there a second to that? Second. Who seconded? That was Meg Teach Out. Meg Teach Out. No other discussion? Hearing none, I'll do a roll call vote. I'm going by my list. Amy Top. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. Andrew Jones. Uh, hi. Carl Gropey. Hi. Chantel. Bracket. Chantel. I sorry, I said it before I unmuted. <laughs> okay. Don. Abstain. Ethan. Aye. Lisa. Aye. Mary Ann. Mary Ann Karen, are you on? Megan, Meg Tito. Hi. Mika Tucker. Hi. Michael Gray. Hi. Sarah Root. Hi. Stacy Peters. Hi. Susan K. Hi. I have it. Oh, Bob, sorry. I'm not used to people being here looking at the thing. I apologize. Bob Gray. Right. And Kathy, you're willing to accept? I'm willing to accept. And real quick, we had missed one there. Mary Ann, are you back on? Or no? Yes, I'm back on. Marianne, are you an I? Yes. Okay. Congratulations, Kathy. The meeting's yours. Mm. Uh, Kathy, just before you go, uh, Don, I'd like to thank you. I haven't been on the full board long, but I appreciate your um, communication with me and your um, organization of the board. So thank you. Great. I would second that. Second thank that you, Don. Too. Thanks, Don. 
Thank you, Don. Are there adjustments to the agenda? Just assign a timekeeper. Um, I'd like to assign a timekeeper. Anybody want to keep time? And I'll volunteer at once. I can keep time. So sign Kathy. Um, Kathy? Yeah. Just one note. Um, just if I don't know where the mic is on your um, video, you but if, if you can, I can move can, up. If it can be closer, that'd be great. Thank you. I just for make sure we're clear. Clear. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know where. It's in the ceiling. Got to yell, Kathy. Okay, I can be loud. <laughs> All right. So public comment. No public comment tonight. Okay. Um, yeah. So, sorry to interrupt. I did see a private caller on the attendee list, and I was just wondering if that person could identify him or herself, Thank or you. if we know. Is that Orca? We were on the other call when they came in. I'm sure it's Orca. Okay. But we don't need to identify them unless they speak. No, I was just wondering if it was a board member. Ah. Okay. Thanks. Um, elected vice chairperson. Do I have any nominations? Currently, it's Lisa. I would nominate Lisa Floyd. I'll second that. Any other nominations for vice chair? I would nominate Carl Groppy. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Mm. Okay. All right. So, do you guys? I mean, as a board, you need to decide whether you're going to do a roll call vote or whether you want us to try to push out a Google form. I'm fine with a roll call. This I is Sarah. Hear. I I would recommend have, the roll call. Personally. Have nominations been closed? No. Yeah, uh, any other nominations? Move to close. Second, Ethan. Right. The nominations have been closed. We have Carl and Lisa. So just go through and call each person and make a pick. Point of order. Might be asked, might be nice if we ask if they're willing to fulfill the role. Um, they gave thumbs ups. They did, thank you. Um, okay, so Andrew Jones. Lisa Floyd. Uh, Carl, Carl Graffi. Uh, I'll abstain. Um, are we sure? Chantel Brackett. I'll abstain as well. Um, Don Shaw. I'll go for Carl. Okay. Uh, Ethan. I'll go for Lisa. Um, Lisa. Lloyd? I'll abstain. Uh, Megan Teachout? Uh, Lisa Floyd? Micah Tucker? My vote is for Lisa Floyd. Uh, Michael Gray? Lisa Floyd. Um, Sarah Root. Lisa Floyd. Nancy Peters. Lisa Floyd. Susan Kay. Sue, are you on? 
Yeah, sorry about that. Lisa Floyd. Anybody else? Did I miss anybody? Marianne's still on? Or or Marianne, are you still on? Oh, so I didn't. Chelsea. Oh, and I did it too. Bob Gray. Right. Right. Lisa. Lisa. Okay. All right. So. Do you have a total, Marianne? Kathy Bell. Um, Kathy Galuzzo, Lisa Floyd. So I have 10 names. Yeah. Thank you. So Lisa has it. Elect a clerk. I think Stacy's your clerk. Isn't Stacy your clerk? Mm -hmm. uh, Stacy, are you the clerk then? No, am I the clerk then? I think you are the clerk. Yes. You are. <laughs> um, I would nominate Stacy Peters. It's my favorite I dub. <laughs> I second that. Any other nominations? Move to close. It's really fast. Trigger finger, you got there, Sarah. <laughs> Pretty good at it, aren't I? <laughs> With lots of practice. <laughs> All right, so we'll do a roll call. Uh, Andrew Jones. Aye. Carl Graffi. Aye. I suggest since there's only one, we would instruct it to have one vote cast for Ms. Peters, the clerk. I'll make a motion for one vote cast for Stacy Peters. So moved. Um, appoint a recording secretary. I don't know if we have anybody that is willing to do it anymore. Anybody have recording secretaries on their board that would be able to be willing to be a recording secretary? Very fun job. I, Jackie's sister is doing it for us, but maybe I could approach her. Yeah, talk to the board. Yeah, um, so uh, the, one of our board member's sister is doing it for uh, the first branch board. Um, so perhaps I can ask her if she's interested in doing it, be our recording secretary, and then I can bring her back if she's interested. So since we don't have anybody, we'll move on and I'll see if somebody's interested. Appoint one member for signing AP and payroll. Currently that position is Rodney and I. Does that still work for you? That works for me. Because those are appointed. They're not um, voted, elected. Yeah, I'd be willing to do it again. Um, I'm not, Rodney's not on, so I'm not sure if somebody else interested in doing it. Well, I can do it. Um, I'd rather have Rodney do it, but I mean, I'm available to, to get over to the SU and sign things if we need that as the alternative or alternate. It's not an alternate. We both have to sign. Oh, um, um, I think, I think, well, I know that Rodney's father recently passed away. Um, so I suspect that he's with family right now. I'm, I, I don't feel comfortable speaking for him, but, um, it is a responsibility he's taken seriously, and I believe he's gotten to the SU offices to sign in a timely manner um, as he served in that position. So um, I'm not certain that he wants to continue with that, but I also um, know that his father died two days ago. So um, I suspect and in he Rodney, I think he would be happy to continue doing it. I mean, him and I have talked about it before. He doesn't mind doing it. Um, for him to get I feel to. I feel more comfortable appointing somebody who's present. Okay. Could, could could we? Sorry, could we nominate him in his absence, and if he refuses, bring this back up in the next meeting? Given that he's already had this rule, we can do that. But I think we just had someone express a desire to have somebody from that's present. Yeah, I'm just wondering if if that would mitigate that if. 
Um, so why don't we nominate another person and then we can discuss it. If um, Rodney really still wants to do it, maybe we'll come back and I'll see if the board will allow him and I to switch because I'm okay with. I appoint to. So do we have a second person who's interested in doing it? I'm not willing to, to make a trip over to the SU as much as I'd have to to do that. I'd do it as an alternate, but not as a uh, permanent. Anybody else? Sue K, you're great at this on our board. I don't hear her speaking up. Bob, do you have any interest? Not right now. So I could be a point. Well, we need two people to do it. So Ethan, would you, since nobody else seems to want to do it, would you be comfortable with it being Rodney? Yes. Okay. It's pretty important, folks. All right. Can I just ask a question, just because I don't know what's the what's the schedule as far as like having to be available at the SU? How what's the frequency? Sarah, you want to answer that? Every two weeks, Chantel. On a specific day, or does it vary? Uh, we try to have the SU warrants ready to go by Tuesday or Wednesday, for checks to be issued by Friday. And then if we need to do, um, because I have signing authority for the SU, if we have to do an emergency payment, that also would be a time that we would, like we just had one last week to get tents on order. And we had to ask um, for an emergency signing. And do we have to be there at the same time to sign or I just have to make, okay. No. And you can do it. Oh, Pat, if you have the ability to sign electronically, we can also send the warrants to you. That is what Kathy does. She reviews and signs them electronically because she has that capability of an electronic signature. I do as well. I'm willing, I'm willing to step up and to, I'm willing to step up and do it. Thank you. I'm sorry, I missed who was speaking there. Chantel. Chantel, thank you. So you would do it, Chantel? Yeah. Okay. So I'm working, I'm primarily working remotely from home in Sharon. So, elect, I mean, but I have electronic capability as well. So, okay. Very good. Can I nominate Kathy Galuzzo and Chantel Brackett for member for signing APM? They're program? appointed, not nominated. Oh, they're appointed. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Dawn. So, Chantel. Point one alternate. Um, yep, you're good. We're good. We're good. Designate newspaper, radio stations for official notices. Currently, the Herald and the Valley News are what we're using. Does the Herald and Valley News work for everybody? Any other? Okay. We've at our board meeting we've talked about that this needs to be updated a little bit about where we're posting that there's so many electronic possibilities now. I know it doesn't require that, but I'm just wondering if we should appoint that. Um, so that would be under the designated posting places coming up on the agenda. This was just the newspapers, the radios. Yeah. So. Uh... So backing up a bit, I got the Herald and the Valley News. Is there a radio station to add to that? Uh, the Great Eastern Radio Network is where we currently use for school closings. The Great Eastern Radio Network is where we currently use for school closings. Okay, thank you. Which my understanding is that it has multiple different stations within that. So we want to also use that radio station. Well, we need to close, close, close. Is there another radio station? Set date, time, location of regular school board meetings. Currently, we are uh, alternate. The you guys currently are the fourth Monday of the month. My understanding. Alternate and you alternate between full and exact. Right. For the fourth Monday, we alternate between um, 
executive board and full board. Does that still work for everyone? How does that work? What's your opinion of that, Jamie? The alternating. Well, you know, I got to tell you, it's the first time I've worked in an SU that had an executive board. So I'm still trying to wrap my head around what that looks like. I've always dealt with a full board. And so I'm trying to figure out what should be going to the executive board versus what goes to the full board. And that's something that, you know, I need to work with the executive board about in their upcoming meeting. Um, can someone who's been on the both boards for longer than I give sort of a rationale for the split? Um, yeah, I, uh, the, the, the executive board um, uh, usually does more of a, a, of a deeper dive into things. Um, a lot of times, um, for example, the executive board went through the uh, transportation contract proposal uh, before the before the full board did, um, some of the some of the more mundane business gets done by the executive board. Um, some of the motions around uh, 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 approving various submissions to the state, for example, that sort of um, uh, paperwork stuff that, that that requires board approval by statute gets done at the executive level. And we've had trouble getting a quorum for a full board for. Ostensibly, the executive board was created for that very purpose. Multiple evenings, we had meetings called, and we didn't have a quorum. So we created the executive board in order to continue with our functions. That makes sense. That makes sense. Right. So I support. I support. And, and, and the executive board was given. Uh, authority to do any uh, any work other than hiring a superintendent. That was my understanding. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, fourth Monday, alternating between executive board and full board. Six p.m. works. Designate. Um, Hosting places. This is what you were talking about, Ethan. Where do where do we post the? Thing? What do we feel about about various of you know Facebook and other social media sites? Is that official or is that sort of as ha ad hoc? Well, I think my concern about it is if we miss it, and you've designated it as a posting, so I just caution you about that. We can still post there as practice. I just get concerned when we start naming all these areas and if we miss one. Mm -hmm. So for right now, our posting place is the website for the full board meetings. You wanted to add the WRBSU Facebook page. I feel like I can control that. But that's I, I would feel comfortable with that. I feel that's I mean, moving ahead. Anybody else have any places they want it posted? They're thinking about? Okay, so for now, the WBRSU website and web WRBSU face, uh, Facebook page. Ray's on it. You just gave me a big thumbs up. Okay. Um, and we have other. Is there any other things you feel we need to designate or appoint right now? Act to approve minutes of July 13th. I didn't see any minutes. So I think there was a shout out by Christy to get these minutes. Yeah, Christy sent me the recordings today. I didn't, I never volunteered to take minutes because I'm But I said I would go through the recordings. Does anybody remember if they took minutes on the 13th or the 10th? So what I said to Christy, I would do is I'll, we recorded them, we'll go through, we'll get draft minutes out to you for approval of the next meeting. Same thing with August 10th. All right, so we are on reports to the board. Uh, okay. All right, so you have my superintendent's report Embedded in that were 
the draft strategic plan overarching goals, and they're the goals that we'll use for the CIP. The admin team worked on this during the administrative retreat. They align nicely to the tasks and goals that you guys had in your strategic plan. The idea though, is that we would capture those in three overarching goals that looks at forming and sustaining a comprehensive multi-tiered system of supports that the WRVSU will implement a pre-K through 12 proficiency-based learning system, and that the WRVSU will improve student learning and increase equitable educational opportunities through the development of a culture that promotes interdependence among all stakeholders, example being like the WRVSU Virtual Academy as one example, and enhances student achievement, choice, and voice. So the SU will be coming back with a fourth goal that more specifically speaks to equity as we move forward. That is part of something that we need to do is our continuous improvement plan from the Agency of Education. We were in, in designated as a SU that needed to address equity. And so we'll get to that at a future um, agenda. But Desi designated by who, Jamie? By the Agency of Education, Don. Our continuous improvement plan, which is tied to our federal grants. And uh, we had a district that was designated in regards to that, too. And we'll talk about that at that district. Um, and so later in the agenda, I'll look for you guys to provide feedback and hopefully move to approve these. What you'll see is from this, Schools will then look, and they've already created draft CIPs that have been submitted, but the idea would be that we have roadmaps of success both at the SU, which you call a strategic plan, and at the local districts that spill out of these overarching goals and all the tasks align, and that your principals will provide updates on a monthly basis around each one of these goals and if you remember back in July, you approved a data calendar that then the principals will be providing data monthly, social emotional data was in September. And so you'll get data reports monthly, both at the SU level and at the local level at different data points that all go to support this work. The idea being it's a way for you to progress monitor how we move forward. Okay. Um, the only other thing I'll add is that I had some letters of resignation to my report that I just wanted to make you aware about. We had a letter of resignation from Jane Phelps. Uh, she served us for 30 years um, as a paraeducator in the SU. Um, and James decided not to return this upcoming school year. Is it all right with the board if I go through each one of them and then you can accept? Uh, we had a resignation from Nicole Racico, uh, who is a special educator um, and is going to be moving out of state for the upcoming school year. And um, we had another special educator who is also has resigned from WRVSU um, and wanted to wish the students, faculty, staff, and families of the WRVSU all the best and had served us for four years. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, that was uh, Erica Young. And I'm hopeful that uh, you know, as we move forward, that resignations, um, you know, decrease. I think that everyone had a different circumstance. There was not one circumstance. And um, it's challenging times and they face a COVID-19 as well. Jamie, have we received all the letters of intent to return? Yes, at this time we have. Okay. Thank you, Don, for asking that. Can someone move to accept those resignations? So moved. Second. All those, any discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? So moved. Um, the rest, we have a pretty, uh, we have a lot on the agenda, and so you'll hear from me later. Um, tonight, we're focused on our current finances. Uh, there's a budget timeline that hopefully you looked at in your packet. I also add, as coming up, the central office staff had quite a bit in their reports. If you didn't have the opportunity to look at those, they're going to highlight some things. But we've been very hard at work, and i got to put a shout out that the admin team, the teachers and staff have worked so incredibly hard to safely and effectively reopen on the 8th. And I gotta tell you, we are one of a handful of SUs that are moving forward with five days of in-person instruction. And part of that is why we're, we're getting some publicity for this right now in a positive light. And I should hear from CBS here in the next day or two of whether or not they're going to be prepared and have gone through all the things the Department of Health has required them because I've made it clear that they need permission from the Department of Health and I need to see it in order to work with us. But I do suspect that there, it's, a, it's highly likely that they will be uh, capturing us on CBS 60 and 60 for the SU over the next couple of weeks in regards to our reopening plans. And so that's really exciting. Uh, there's been a lot that you guys have been doing throughout the years. I think some pub uh, positive publicity for our faculty, staff, admin, and all you um, is well deserved, and it's high time. So I just want to let you know we continue to work on that, and then if you have any other questions, I'll entertain them. Any questions for Jamie? Anyone? Yeah, um, this is Lisa. I just have a question um, around our remote option. I had a family ask me about that the other day. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could share with, uh, with us what that will look like for families who don't feel comfortable sending their students back for five days. Can I wait and do that during COVID updates? Sure. We can't hear the communication going on. Yeah, no, both. I was just asking Jamie if you wanted me to actually do my discussion items with you all tonight or request that they got put on a future agenda item because we have so much to do tonight. So I sent you all my reports. Um, the one update that I wanted to provide to you was we received the second draft of the supervisory union audit on Friday. So my team and I will go through that and see if we have any further questions or concerns for the auditors. And if that's all good to go, then we will get it out to the executive board for review. And then down at the end of my report is where my discussion items were. So the four, three main topics for this section, each year the Agency of Education determines our allowable tuition versus the announced tuition for each of our member districts and the other districts throughout the state of Vermont. My understanding after learning more about this is that you as a board need to decide if we are going to bill or credit once that is done and it is an all or nothing policy. So if we bill exterior districts or credit exterior districts, we also have to do it within our own districts. So I just need your guidance on what you would like me to do for that. Um, the last couple of years, as some of you already are aware of, the AOE is getting later and later at getting that information out to us. It's supposed to be done by statute by December. And last year we received it in July for FY19. So due to all the problems with the uploads um, that are going through the state longitudinal data system, it's getting that part of it out later and later. So what is your- So question? I would suggest we just review what's upcoming and we'll put these as an action item at the next board meeting. Is that cool with folks? I just want to give you a preview. I don't think we need this decision tonight. Is that good? Thumbs up. I wish you were in here with me. Okay. The second item is process for not paying tuition as a result of no residency verification. 
a lot of our sending districts um, have students that we did not pay tuition for because to date we still have not been able to verify residency. So I believe that what should happen in the future is that we should be doing residency hearings whenever we have a questionable situation that we can't verify or a student who has not verified residency prior to the end of the second semester, if at all possible. So that would be my recommendation for you all to consider. But again, it will be up to you how you wish to handle that. And then my last one um, is board stipends. And when do you want them processed? Please remember that you all will be paid through payroll this year for our auditors and for legal counsel. We will no longer be paying that as an accounts payable. So if you have not been paid by payroll historically, which is the majority of all of you, you will need to do the payroll documentation in order to get your board stipends this year. So those options will all be there to vote on um, at the next meeting. There'll be action items. Is there any questions about those before Stacey? Tara, I just wanted a little bit of clarification on the idea of residency hearings. Who would be administering those hearings? Your superintendent. I see. And Thank legal you. counsel if we needed them, but primarily it's done by the superintendent. Okay, perfect. Right. In the past, I thought we had a, someone that went out to check residencies in the cases like that. And we're not going to be doing that and anymore? Not, more likely than not, I would. Yep. I didn't, I didn't hear that. I said more likely than not, I would do that. Yes. We would hire someone to do that work in regards to verifying. Some SUs mm -hmm. use like a PI. Yes. Where that word. I think yep. this is for those cases yeah. where after that work, there is still no residency. Right, exactly, Stacey. That's right over by the... And there'd need to be an official hearing. If it's looking sticky, then certainly legal counsel would be called in to support this work as well. Can I ask how many cases we've had historically? My sense is, Don, there's times that it could have been sticky and it, and it wasn't. It didn't get to that level. I don't know how diligent we've always been about verifying at times. One, one case this year. We have one case this year that was pretty sticky. One case in how many years? Well, that was this year. I can't speak to the other ones prior. Okay. I don't recall any others. That's all. I just, I. Okay. And it's a big, it's a, you know, monetarily, it's a pretty big deal. I mean, we worked on this. It ended up being upwards of. I want to say 80000 Yeah, like $80,000. So it's just something that I need to make certain that the board takes action on about how we want to go about it. And I want to have the process established in writing and in, in our process and procedure manual that this is how we as a supervisory union will be handling residency. It's important that we have that documented. So we won't be doing it at the local school level anymore. Is that right? I think you have no, to. No, the agree. last step would be that they'll come back to the, that local level. Done. Yeah, but I think you as a, a full board have to decide what the process is because you all should be doing the same process. Mm hmm. Okay. Okay. These are all things that are going to come back as action items at our next meeting. And that would be an executive session board, correct? Yeah, that would be the executive committee if that's what you guys decide tonight. That's what I'm recommending. Okay. Right. Oh, well, that's all. That's all I had. Unless you had questions on my report. I have a question. When do you do a balance sheet about with the uh, finances of the SU to the board? That is normally supposed to be done quarterly. Sorry, couldn't hear the. I couldn't hear the question. So, um, Bob asked when we do a a statement of finances to the board. For the for the board, but if you all wish to have it more than that, you just dictate what you want us to do. And Tara said we usually get it quarterly. I think we should have it every meeting. Did you guys hear that? Bob is recommending we have it at every meeting. How much work does does that create to be able to get done? I mean, is it do you have it like something that you just done here? 
it is something that we can absolutely do if you choose to have it at every meeting. Um, do we want to can you guys hear them? I think we got to speak up in this room. Okay. Sorry, Bob was asking how frequently we give a balance sheet report to the full board, and I said our, it should be done quarterly, and his recommendation is to have it done monthly. So if you all would like that done monthly, you just need to let us know what your wishes are, and we will make it happen. This is Sarah. Quarterly is fine with me. Um, this is Lisa, and I'm just wondering if it makes sense to, to sort of strike a balance between the two um, and have it present at every full board meeting as opposed to quarterly, so with a little more frequency than what we have seen it, but at the same time, um, not necessarily every month. I think this that's is, a good idea. Yeah, this is Chantal. I'm fine with quarterly, too. I like Lisa's idea of just the full board meeting. I like Lisa's idea as well. I think the bi-monthly makes more sense since otherwise every other one's going to land on an executive board meeting. So, you know, I think having it be consistent is a good idea. I would make a motion. I don't think you need to make a motion. We just, it's just no, I, I'm here in the direction of the board as the superintendents that we provide those to you bi monthly at the full board meetings. Comfortable. Yeah. That would be good. Supervisor? Absolutely. Director of Special Services. Yes. <clears throat> good evening, everyone. I uh, hope everyone was able to read my report. Um, I touched base on three different topics the alternative classroom restructuring. The AOE report on the indicators of uh, five and seven and the SPED restructuring. Are there any questions regarding my report? Can you guys hear Don? So a few people can't hear you. So his question was, do we have any questions regarding his report? <laughs> but my only I gotta add to that, there was a lot of information in that. And so it talked about restructuring some areas in special ed that we're going to get to the why shortly here in the budget presentation. But there's also some corrective action things that we need to do for the AOE. Um, just to get a general drift of it, uh, these efficient, it sounds like these were efficiencies um, of spreading out larger student load to each professional in each school. Is that correct? Is that what you're assigning? That's correct. What I found was that we had, um, it wasn't fair and balanced across the SU uh, where uh, some school districts would have the case manager, one person having five students, where another district, one person having 27 students on their caseload. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, what's fair and balanced or fair and, and equitable uh, case management, it's anything between uh, 15 and 20 students. I believe Carl has a question. I, I'm sorry, Don. I have a. I, as I look at it, I see there's a SPED report, WRVSU Board 824 2020. And then there's one that's uh, that has a parentheses two after it. I think oh. they're the same. They're, they're 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 just the same documents. Okay. Yes, I think and it's just two copies of it. That's what I see, unless there's an update. I didn't see any update on them. Okay. No, Thank I I think that that must have just got copied twice. It should be dated August 18th, 2020. 19th or 18th? 18th. 18th, yes. Yeah, they're the same document as far as I can see. And are we feeling like we're staffed enough with to meet these? Yeah, uh, currently, and again, I, I, had, I had moved some people, reassigned some folks uh, to support other districts. Uh, and again, looking at that um, a reasonable caseload of anywhere between 15 and 20 students, every case manager is 14 or below currently. How was the feedback from um, your staff? Uh, so far, pretty positive. Uh, there's a lot of questions, but nothing negative. 
I mean, I think it's important to add one of the things is Don and I continue to meet with the special ed staff. We're talking about we this all has to come under the guise of one comprehensive system. And that special education is is not any different. There's not a magic wand in special education. And so what we're looking to do is say, we've got to work as a team in regular education and special education to ensure that it's a wraparound approach to best supporting students. And one of the steps you heard in, in Don's report is, is that we're really pushing on principals that they have to act as the LEA, which means essentially they have to oversee and make decisions when the team can't agree in an IEP team meeting because those are their students. We can't work in silos. And what I would say is, is as we've analyzed, there are some silos at, in, across the SU that we're trying to slowly tear down. But one of them that we had to hyper-focus on was special education because it was clear that folks weren't communicating that principals did not have a sense of what interventions and supports were happening within their building. And as a superintendent, that's just unacceptable. We've got to ensure that your educational leaders knows what is happening with all their students. And I have to say the emphasis is all. And so that's what we're trying to create is a culture of we and not you and I, and that, that that's Bob's job. No, that's all of our jobs. We all have to work together in this. I want to know, does the board know what an LEA is? I always have to remind myself, but I was going to ask that. Thank you. It's the local education administrator. So like what I just said is they're the decision maker at the table if the team can't come to consensus around what needs to happen for the student in regards to interventions that supports service via an IEP. And one of the things we've changed and one of the things you're gonna see in your fiscal update is, is that we put that responsibility on the principals as your educational leaders. And does that fact, mean that they, is not the case. Does that mean they get a, a, a final say necessarily? It, I mean, they would work in conjunction with Don. Yeah, yeah, again, it's at the table. You have to have somebody that has the ability to make decisions that are, that will impact the uh, financially. And so when you have somebody at the table that doesn't have that authority, by law, that you should, it shouldn't go there. So you have to have somebody that has that authority. And uh, as we're talking to the administrators, um, they're going to be the LEA, the local education agency for a lot of different kids. Um, when there's a decision that uh, they know of that's going to impact the budget uh, or it's um, a new hire, they'll be consulting with me. And so we'll make dec decisions together prior to the meeting just so that they know which way we could go and which way we shouldn't go. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just imagining a possibility of a, a, a disagreement on, on practice. But is that not really what's what this is about? It's a principal wouldn't be able to overstep a sped instructor as far as a practice. Hopefully, it would be something they'd work out together. So yeah, I, I don't think we're. It would be the practice of how you're going to instruct, but what tools might be out there or resources that might be out there that can support a, a student. For instance, a parent might come in um, and. They, uh, the student might need uh, occupational therapy, and the parent might request um, equine, as I might say that, equine, uh, equine therapy uh, somewhere. Uh, and the principal would be to have the authority to say, yes, that'll meet that kid's needs, or uh, no, we have occupational therapists who can do that job in-house, and we don't have to go out, out of the district to provide that service. I mean, Ethan, the other thing is I'm going to be looking at as the superintendent saying to principals with Don, help me understand why the team made these decisions around interventions and supports, right? Like example might be a student struggling with literacy and let's say they're only getting reading intervention twice a week. Well, we know all the research says they need it four times a week. So I'm looking at, I'm not going to go to the special educator and ask that necessarily. Don might, but I want to say to the principal, you were there. You got to help me understand. 
And so the idea is that what we're trying to do is create this emphasis of you are an instructional leader for all and that the system all has to make sense. We can't have students who are service VIEPs getting less interventions potentially than a student who service via a targeted intervention plan. And my sense is there's probably times we have that across the ESU. So that's part of what we're trying to address is ensure that we have some clear and consistent definitions to what intervention is and how we go about increasing intensity. Good, thank you. We need, a, we need to have, a, the LEA needs to be at the table if we're gonna spend money and has to decide probably in a, in a team effort whether that money is going to be spent. We have 22 out of district placements, I read your report. And um, yeah, that, that goes back to what superintendent's talking about is building that MTSS structure that we got to look at what are we, what are we not doing, you know, and build instead of just shipping out. So, an LEA would have to be present at the table to decide whether or not another district placement happens. And we're going to have a, you know, a really clearly defined procedure of what have we done to exhaust interventions and supports prior to that next step. And one of the gaps we've seen is right now we don't have a menu of interventions socially, emotionally, that's comprehensive enough to not result in our buildings feeling at times the only tool they have is what was formerly known as the restorative classroom. So we're looking to put in another level of intervention before we get to that. Formally known, what is it known as now? We don't have a name for it yet. Okay. And I, 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 did... that I met with the team today for an hour uh, to do more visioning and talking about how do we make that a more uh, interdependent system within the buildings they're in. Hmm. Um, you know, one of the things we found was that uh, principals and staff didn't necessarily know all the RC staff or be able to identify them by name. And that didn't feel great. I think either way is what I would say. And so we're trying to ensure that that system is more of an interdependent we system. I also think it should help when we go to transitioning students back. I mean, I think one of the things that we've heard is that we had some problems transitioning students. And I think part of that is folks not feeling like they had the tools to best receive students. And one of the things Don and I are trying to communicate is that's a non-negotiable. We got to build toolkits up and you got to understand that that student's going to feel welcomed and nurtured and that we're providing the scaffolding and supports needed for them to transition back. But just saying no is not, and it's not going to be the answer. And one of the steps we're going to put in place, uh, for instance, if we have a, a student from Chelsea who's attending South Royalton, that case manager will be more involved on the, all the meetings and the progress reporting and the, whatever is going to happen with that child during their time at the formerly known as the RC classroom. Uh, so that connection will stay. It's not, it's not going to be out of sight, out of mind. Stacy, uh, did you get your question answered? Uh, no, uh, thank you, Don. Yeah. Um, Jamie and Don, I was, I was hoping that you could just speak a little bit to how the plan to transition existing families who are part of what was once known as the restorative classroom, um, given that they probably have a lot of uh, personal and emotional investment in being in that, um, just if there's a way to kind of move them kind of calmly into the next phase of this um, or yeah, what that um, might look like. Yeah. We've been taking. yeah, and I've, I've talked to several families already um, uh, about the, the transition to a new program, a different model. We're gonna, it's all going to be the same. It's just not going to be a clinical model right now. And one of the, one of the uh, aspects that I want to add to that program is more of a, uh, uh, a BCBA out of Claire Martin, uh, which would be funded. Hopefully we can, I think we have enough money in the IDAB grant. And so that person would, would be housed or working very closely day to day with the the classrooms, all three classrooms and their instructors, 
However, if there was a hot spot or a, a, um, a hot spot in Chelsea, that person can go out and work with the Chelsea team to really kind of shore up the IEP and the behavioral program in that building prior to making a referral for either uh, the, the, the alternative classroom or an alternative school somewhere else. And uh, again, working with teams, building up their, as Jamie said, the toolboxes, getting full of tools of different methods and, and uh, modalities to teach these kids. Again, back to the we've had a lot of interaction with families. Um, and, uh, you know, so far it's been pretty positive. Uh, we've had two families who thought they were going to go to a, another uh, added district program. I reached out to them and, and explained that I didn't feel like we've exhausted all our resources here in town and that we want to have another shot. Both, both families were very pleased with that suggestion. So, Thank you. In addition to uh, families have been contacted uh, by Dr. Ketterer mm -hmm. and then followed up with Michelle Pringle, who's going to be taking the lead for our most intensive programming. And you're going to hear me use the word programming intentionally. I'm trying to train the staff on that because I think program speaks to a self-contained unit. And that's not what we're looking to have. We want students to be able to transition in and out. We may know a student's really successful in a content and that they should be continuing to receive that content mainstreamed. And maybe they need other intensive supports the rest of the day. So you're going to hear me use the word programming because I don't think we want a program that's just self-contained. I think we want to be able to speak to the fact that they can be fluid. And that, and that really chimes into the, the importance of the principals being the LEA and being part of those that programming because they know the teachers that we can uh, get kids into their classroom and really build up their uh, self-confidence. Any other questions for Don? Uh, Don. Um, do you know about the UVMIT? Yep. Have you used them? Yep. Okay. Uh, Bob's question was, um, he asked Don if he knew about the UVMI team. Yeah. And um, and had he used them, and Don re responded yes. Does everybody know what the UVMI team is? Do you all know what the UVMI team is? No. Yeah, it's a, it's a team of folks, professionals, that will come in and work with schools uh, it used to be free of charge. It's no longer free of charge, and it's it's not a. I, I don't know what they charge now, but they'll come in, and if we have a, a student that's really we're kind of at loss with and trying to, we're exhausting everything. We're just not making that progress. They'll come in and, and assist us to really shore up a kid's uh, program, and they have the experts across the field of, of education that that really um, uh, fine tune a program for a school and really work with kids. And a lot of times I've dealt with the I team with the real intensive needs kiddos. Any other questions for Don? Thank you, Don. Um, technology, Ray. Hey, everybody. You have my report. I entertain any questions. Uh, Ray, the, the 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 inventory process that 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 you're going through is, as you're looking at um, making sure that we're maximizing our depreciation and, and you know uh, not um, retaining gear beyond its 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 usefulness is that revealing any kind of deficits or surprises in our budget? I mean, to, at, at either the SQ level or the individual boards. Or as you basically the question uh, in, in, in a general sense is as you're flipping over the rocks, what kind of bugs and, and, and things are you finding? Uh, no, no, no great big bugs, Carl. I, I want it to be uh, well planned out into the future. I, I am not expecting any big holes at, at the moment. Thank you. Ray, all of our kids have a computer and need one. Yes. Um, one quick question, Ray. Uh, 
what was our return rate for computers that had been loaned out at the end of last school year? I don't think I ever heard anything about that. Yep. Um, very high. I'm going to say 95%. So um, the ones that are still out, we expect the students to show up with them very shortly. Ray, it's sorry, did I interrupt someone? No, 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 you're good. Okay. Uh, I'm curious about the Blackboard system and other educational technology that teachers might be using or be trained to use in the event of remote education. Um, I know back in March, nobody was really trained and everybody had to wing it. And I just wanted to check in and see that, you know, procedures have been in place to make sure that people know how to use this, are, are on the same suite and using the same tools and know how to use them for some level of proficiency. Sure. So uh, Blackboard is not something teachers use. Right. What the school uses, and now the superintendent to send alert messages, phone calls, texts, emails. Right. So, um, yes, uh, there was a lot of winging it in the spring. And uh, Mary Ellen might remind me, we had uh, two days of PD over three days, right? Uh, focused on technology at the end of the year. There had been a little bit offered over the summer, and then there'll be more starting Thursday into next week. Yeah, Mary Ellen can expand upon that in her upcoming report. Any more questions for Ray? This is Meg Ticho. I have, I don't, uh, I'm not a tech person, but um, I have liked using Zoom a lot more in the webinars and things that I have participated in over the last six months. And I'm wondering if we have given any thought to shifting software as we think about a possible return to remote learning and the children that will be in virtual. Uh, quite honestly, no. And, and I'll give you the full reason here in a minute. But, you know, on any given day, we might have 400 people using Meet. So, um, Zoom offers certain features free, as do its competitors, Google and Microsoft. And just like with our other tools, this is what we have used and will continue to use at this point. I think that the okay, idea you. is, Meg, is that it's part of our Google Classroom platform. And as we look to move forward, we're going to try to leverage Google Classroom across the whole SU. And we, are, we really are a Google school. We're using Google Chromebooks more and more. Um, and we're trying to really utilize Google platforms. And they're pretty kind to schools in regards to what they charge us. I think what Ray was going to speak to is there's some incurred costs if we were going to move to Zoom, is my understanding. I would Thank also. You. I, was, I was worried that it was like the legal stuff early on that it, it seemed like things got we were on Zoom and then we hopped off. So it's good to hear that there's at least been some thought behind it. No, no, we were never on Zoom, and, and this is the part I'll explain. Like, is that um, right at the shutdown? It was not even legal to use Zoom with students under 13. So we were using Meet with students as, as young as pre-K by the end of the year. Now they have fixed that. And Zoom has also uh, settled with the New York AG's office in the middle of the summer with the deficiencies that they had. Um, but at, at, at this point, it's only at that point, mid-summer, that I would even consider using Zoom. Again, across 400 adults and 1,300 students. Okay. All right, any other questions? Okay. Um, that was grant coordinator, Cynthia. You're on the screen. Are you there? I am. Okay, there you are. <clears throat> okay, any questions about it? We have uh, received all of the federal and state funds that we are have applied for. And um, I may be looking at some social emotional um, uh, uh, misuse of, you know, of drugs. Uh, things, but at the moment, 
I'm just trying to make sure that we have support in the areas that you need, like um, the devices and um, trainings and things like that. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions, anyone? Cynthia, do you feel that we have, I know at various times you've been uh, advocating for us to, 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 to make sure that we've got family engagement people, that we've got the uh, uh, appropriate kind of uh, interventionists and, and uh, people like that that are reaching some of our um, slippier, slipperier families, to uh, 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 use a, a, a euphemistic term. Do we feel no. that we've got the, 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 the resources to reach those families, especially in this time of, of, uh, uh, of pandemic? We have all the, the, the things we need to get uh, our, our, our various uh, MTSS supports out to the families? Well, we certainly have invested in them. So uh, it is to be hoped that it will, um, that all our investments will reach what we had thought. And I really feel that this is the perfect moment to have a lot of family engagement. And right. I, I think we're, um, we're, we're poised to be able to do that. Okay. Do we have a, do we have a system to, 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 to get feedback and to get, you know, to, to, to track our responses and to, you know, to kind of hone in our, uh, our, our approaches to this? Because I, I, I would imagine that this is, you know, this is uncharted water, obviously, in terms of how we reach our families and how we support their kids being uh, educated in, in these times. And Carl, I'm going to talk about that in my curriculum report, too. Um, I think we don't have a specific tool, but this is definitely the time to employ it because it is probably, um, this is the time that parents can make the most contribution to their children's education. And one of the right. things that I have heard from parents, and this is just, you know, personal gossip, um, is that they really want to know what their pair, what their children are trying to learn. And I think we're making a big effort to make that a priority. Right. I know, I know last year we made that big investment in, in, in Otis and the data warehouse and the data warehousing cloud platform. And I was wondering if this was an opportunity we could leverage our investment into that, into helping to, to, to track some of our, our kids, uh, you know, uh, social emotional learning and, and, and where they're, where they're at. And I'll, I think, be, I'll be talking more about that in my report too, Carl. I think we're basically, we have information. We just, uh, things have been changing so quickly that we can't put everything into, we haven't, a ch let's just put it this way. We haven't a chance to really uh, analyze the data with the constantly changing um, situation as far as how, how education is delivered. I mean, at, the, at this point, how are we really going to measure kids who didn't go to school, who haven't been to school since March and won't be going to school maybe until December? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move us on if we can. I, I think we do have a plan for some of these things. And so I don't wanna get ahead of ourselves because we do have a pretty comprehensive assessment plan. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and the, in my area is the curriculum instruction and assessment. And I'm one of the few areas that kind of reaches out to all the other areas. I know you heard Jamie talk about with technology that kind of overlaps with what I do, with grants overlaps with what I do, with intervention and special ed. I kind of work with all of the other areas, the business office, we, we work together really closely. So um, our team consists of three people, myself and Amy Toth, and she's on the call here tonight, and Charlie Watson, and we kind of touch all the areas. So we've been really busy preparing for the opening of school, helping teachers get ready. Um, we have Amy put on a plan for your first six weeks class, and we had over 24 teachers in that class that um, took that training to plan out the first six weeks of school. So we feel like we're really in a good spot to go. 
We're also working really closely with the interven interventionists. We are developing a robust assessment system for them, as well as taking a look at their curriculum and instruction and setting up plans for them to monitor students' progress, to identify that growth and report it back out again. Um, in addition to that, I've also been working with policy committee, as some of you just know, working on an S equity task force to create policies around equity, racial justice, and inclusion. Working for the supervised learning center, which is for our employees, which I think Jamie's going to talk about a little bit later. Creating CIPs for all of our schools, new faculty orientation. We just had our new teachers come in this week and they are great last week and they are great. We love them. We've updated the assessment framework and I did put that in my report for everybody that matches the board calendar that Jamie had given you last time. So you can see when those assessments come out and when they'll get reported back out again. Um, we also work with homeless families. We work with mentors, family engagement, and I could probably go on and on and on. Is there any questions based on the report that was given out? Carl. Oh. Oh, well, I'll use Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> the um, I, I think I, I really appreciate the uh, uh, board data calendar that you, that you uh, gave us. Um, what I'm curious about, though, is, and I usually know all this, this cool Ed lingo, what's an ODR? Office discipline referral. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> So we're trying. We're we're going to be we're going to be tracking discipline against uh, against social emotional learning, and 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 and, and relating that. In, in, yeah, in part of the idea, Carl, would be that you know the average referral is about fifteen minutes of lost instructional time at best. So one of the things we'd look to start to track is how much time are students actually losing on instruction, and how are we putting intervention plans to better support that as we move forward. Okay, I thought this was really, really cool, and I'm looking forward to to, to seeing this uh, get implemented across my next my, my my next. I guess well, we stop in November because we have to do stupid budgets. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm really I, I I found this really exciting. I wanted to say kudos to you guys for this. Stacy, uh, yes. Uh, Prior to my question, I actually just wanted to say thank you all for putting together these uh, written reports. It's been really helpful for me to be able to scroll through and like see quantitatively what's been going on. Um, so thank you all. Mary Ellen, my question, I had two questions actually about Charlie's portion. Um, the first was about working with newly homeless families. And I wondered whether you've seen an increase in homelessness that we should be aware of, if so, is it specific to certain communities? And is there anything board members can do to help those families? Um, and then secondly, the point about uh, providing KN95 masks to staff, I wanted to know if there was some uh, process in place to make sure that students are also adequately masked. Yeah, so, you know, we'll continue to gain data on homelessness as the school year opens. And every school district has target intensive social emotional teams now that's going to be analyzing and looking at that data. And if we are struggling with best supporting those students from a school level, you can see that we're looking to implement an SU wide social emotional team that's going to have the greatest minds we have across the SU to think tank with other outside agencies to ensure that there's interagency coordination. Um, Often those were formerly known as child protection teams because it brings DCF to the table, it will bring Clara Martin to the table, and it will also br uh, bring um, our district attorneys to the table to ensure that we're all working together in regards to homelessness, truancy, things of that nature. Um, and your other question was about the mask. We have plenty of PPE that meets the specifications that we put out as recommendations to provide for any student or staff as we move forward. And Great. I can tell you, Stacy, that um, Charlie has received some referrals for homeless families already. It does usually um, get going right around the beginning of the school year. So we are anticipating quite a few more, maybe a little more this year than normal, but um, 
we have plans in place to address that. Thank you. Yep. Anything else for Mary Ellen? Okay. Uh, negotiations. No updates on negotiations from the last time we met. Uh, we're awaiting a response from the support staff. Um, policies? Um, excuse me. When we sent our letter out, didn't we give them a drop dead date to the support staff? I'd have to review that letter, Don. I don't remember. We we should have so that we had not handcuffed ourselves to inactivity. I think the letter came directly from your legal counsel, so I'd have to review it to see whether or not that was provided or not. Hmm. Then we might have to fix that situation. Yep. So you're not waiting. I will, I will find a copy of the letter that went out and report back if I had a date or not. And if not, we'll have to get together as a negotiations team and and deal with that. All right, policies. We just had a policy committee meeting. Lisa, how about you? You want to go and talk about the policy committee meeting? I just, excuse me one second. We just got a comment from Marty Gratz. Evidently, there's a response coming. So we'll look forward to that response. Thank you, Marty. Thanks, Marty. So in our policy committee me committee meeting tonight, we looked at three um, draft policies from the VSBA. They're not um, required policies, but they are recommended. Um, one is the board's relationship with the superintendent. Um, another one relates to budgeting. And a third um, relates to um, handling of staff complaints. And we agreed at the policy committee meeting um, that they will be sent out to the policy committee member um, members because there were only four members um, at our meeting this evening. Um, Mary Ellen will ask people to make copies of those policies, comment on them, and get them back to her by the second week of September so she, she can assimilate all of those comments into draft policies that she'll then get out to all of us. Is that an okay summary? Sound good to me. Okay. Please a reminder not to be corresponding as a policy committee on these. You were clear about that in the policy meeting. Discussion items. So the expectation is that you as a board will get a draft of these policies at your next executive meeting to provide feedback and start the conversation moving forward with the hopes of getting these adopted this fall. Um, 8.1 is discussion items of policies, Jamie. Uh, yeah, you guys had in your packet uh, the disposition of assets policy, F28 and F29 investment. I also put these in for the last full board, the special meeting. These were in there uh, for you guys to review and discuss. So I'm hopeful that you guys could move and adopt these tonight. They were then warned in the paper. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping you'll do. Okay, and they are further down under action items. So we'll bring them up at that point. Do you yes. want to deal with this now? Do you want a motion now? I would love for you just to take care of it. Yeah. it's to, uh, let, it's listed as discussion. I, I move we accept policies at F28 disposition of assets and F29 investment as presented in the uh, board packet. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, Sorry, could, could, you, could, could you tell me who made that second? Sorry, I heard a few voices. Ethan? I did. Oh, <laughs> okay, got it. Well, Ethan did, so you can uh, <laughs> pick one. <laughs> you got it. I want to ask a question. Okay. All right. How, how is that money invested right now? Is it all in one bank? Is it $250,000 guaranteed by the federal government? Do we have accounts that are over 250000 We have what are called sweep accounts. So our money goes sweep into it. We have what are called sweep accounts. Each of the treasurers has their primary checking account and the sweep account. So the funds that are above and beyond the $25,000 that we keep in the general fund, 
go to the sweep account, which is protected by FDIC. So the actual funds, and then they sweep in the money as we need it to cover the expenditures. The bank automatically does that based on the daily balance. So what's the limit? It's 250000 isn't it? Um, I mean, you're handing me in the dollars here. I didn't hear the question or comment. Well, Sorry. I'm trying. The federal government in, um, insures money in an account up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Okay. We have millions of dollars that are dealing with in our business office. How are we doing it? How are we investing them? How, do we know that everything is covered by FDIC insurance? Sarah, I. I... I seem that aren't, aren't all those accounts separate, indicative to the districts rather than the SU? Yes, Don, that is correct. Each entity maintains their own bank account. Okay. And each entity maintains its own sweep account through Mascoma Savings Bank for all entities except for Sharon, which is done through Community National Bank. That's that's why everyone has to go through their own separate arbitrage. Correct. But, so it's not, it's not one lump sum per se, Bob, no. it's individual, individual accounts. No, but we have Wilt and Bethel, 12 million bucks. No. Well, How do we have it invested? And is it all treasurer. Or is it all protected? It is protected. We're based on what the auditors confirmed during our fiscal audit, our funds are maintained in the sweep accounts, which protects them. And just so everyone knows, Don, our auditors, I did invite them tonight, Bob. So if that's a question you have for them after, I encourage you to ask them. Okay. So we have a motion on the table and it's seconded to approve F28 and F29 policies. Is there any other discussion? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, it's so moved. Um, Jamie, are you proposed budget calendar? I think that's after the financial update. Oh, sorry. Financial update and current state of. Okay, so we're going to do financial update and current state of Red River Valley SU. So as Tara's moving and Ray, there's a presentation to project. Um, I thought it was really important as I've met with the auditors and we've dug in to the finances that we provide an overview update for WRBSU of where we're currently at financially at this time. Um, I think that I had a sense that we were dealing with some financial challenges as I accepted the position. As I've gotten into the job, it became clear that I just needed to make certain that we articulated to you all where we currently are financially. And we're starting to make several changes within the business office and also our system of supports, specifically around special education intervention, how we approach universal instruction to find more efficiencies. And I, I'm telling you that it is time for us to change how we do business, because if we continue the same model that we're doing, it's not sustainable. You're up against the tax threshold in most districts already, and we're running deficits across the board. Yeah. And specifically at the SU level. And so I wanted to lay that out to you tonight and then talk to you all about what we're currently doing in response to it. And then also I brought the auditors here so you could ask questions to them because we're also working in conjunction with the auditors to ensure that the steps we're taking make sense based on their feedback. I'm, this is Don. I just want just to caution those of folks that aren't up against the threshold. I don't want the water, water muddied to try to put everything together so that uh, 
it mitigates it. If you hit, you know what I mean? I don't know what you mean. I, I, it, it can be lumped all in together to bring everybody up on one, one level playing field. No, no, no. We're broken all this down by district, Donna. Okay. Are any of these in uh, any of these uh, subjects non-public at this point because we are being recorded? There's an executive session for personnel at the end of the meeting. No, I'm talking about in this report that's coming up financially. No, sir. All this is for public. Okay. We are not talking about any personnel contracts, anything that should be an executive session. Okay. Okay, so what we have here, I know it's hard to read on the screen, um, is the FY1819 audited balances per the last drafts of the audits that we've received. Most of them you've all approved. We have three left to go through approval process. What our projected general fund net income or losses for FY20. And then the last column is the FY1920 cumulative projected surplus or deficit, which is including the FY19 surplus and deficit. We're showing you the general fund for each of the entities and the food service for each of the entities that it implies that has a food service. And then under the SU, the first column is just based on the second draft of the audit that we received on Friday. The second column includes special education, what our projections are for the deficit there. And then again, the general fund adds, the last column adds the two first columns together. So I'll read the numbers if that's what you all would like me to do. I'll go each I'm comfortable with you sharing the presentation as well with the board. Um, can I ask a quick question too? With the numbers, are the individual districts include the deficits shared out or are they no, Andrew, this would be prior to doing the last assessment for the SU because that we wait until we have the audited numbers to do final assessments. So starting right at the top, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. First Branch Unified District in FY19, they had a general fund surplus of $71,516 and a food service surplus of $26,312. Our projected loss in the general fund for FY20 is $111,258.06 in the general fund, $52,679.96 in the food service. For a total general fund deficit of $39,742.06 and food service total deficit of $26,367.96. For GHUD, you have a general fund surplus in FY19 of $78,710, a projected general fund surplus in FY20 of $204,822.94, for a cumulative surplus of $283,532.94. Rochester Stockbridge, you have a general fund surplus in FY19 of $259,483, food service surplus of $37,770, projected surplus in FY20 of $11,734.15, a projected deficit in food service of $62,628.24, for a cumulative general fund surplus of 271-217.15 and a cumulative deficit in food service of $24,858.24. And Sharon, you have a projected or an FY19 deficit in the general fund of 93973 a deficit in food service of $17,569 a projected deficit in the general fund for FY20 in the amount of $74,066.52, food service projected deficit of $7,424.61, for a cumulative general fund deficit of $168,039.52, 
cumulative food service deficit of $24,993.61. For Strafford, in FY19, you had a general fund deficit of $56,382, food service deficit of $42,607, a projected deficit in the FY20 general fund of $99,289.86, with a projected surplus of $10,738.79 in food service for a cumulative general fund deficit of $155,671.86, a cumulative deficit in food service of $31,868.21. Rudd, you had an FY19 general fund deficit of $440,417 a food service deficit of $31,532, a projected general fund surplus in FY20 of $122,487.77, a projected food service deficit of $121,924.85, for a cumulative general fund deficit of $317,929.23 and a cumulative food service deficit of $153,456.85. Then the supervisory union per draft two of the FY19 audit, the current deficit is $68,370. Our projected general fund and special education deficit for FY20 is $492,047.46. For a cumulative general fund deficit for the supervisory union of $560,417.46. So the cumulative in FY20 income or surplus or deficits are prior to audit. This is based on our current reconciliations, which we continue to work through. We do have to submit a revised SEER report to the Agency of Education, which is our special education expenditure report for the closure of the fiscal year. We do have to submit a revised report to them to account for the liability reconciliations that we have completed over the last month. So there could be some additional revenue coming in from the Agency of Education to help offset special education. So that is still a changing balance as far as the special education current deficit. All of these, again, are just based on our current year-end closure. They have not gone through all the auditing process that the auditors do um, and final year-end journal entries, and also any final assessments once we have the solid numbers for the supervisory union and special education. So that's the snapshot as of today. Tara, what's, uh, what's the uh, total deficit for South Wales and Buffalo? Well, before the pre before the SU assesses out, of which you're forty some percent of, before it you're 471, running four hundred seventy one thousand three hundred eighty six dollars and eight cents is your general fund and your food service combined. Um, four hundred seventy one thousand three eight six point oh eight. Okay, and. 40% of the 560? Could potentially go to RUD if that number doesn't change. Yeah, but what, what is it, you know? I can do that math out quick for you, Sure. Bob. Will you go to the next slide while Tara's running that? And we're gonna answer all kinds of questions at the end. 224,000. So can, can, oh, sorry. I, I, I wanted to jump in with a question about um, food service. In general, it seems like we're running, you know, deficits across the board. Is that because of food that was purchased and spoiled while it sat in, in, uh, in, in refrigerators or losses? 
Was that because we weren't able to submit the proper paperwork to get reimbursements uh, under the various uh, uh, funding options uh, or reimbursement options for, for food service? Or, you know, I, I'm, is, is, this, is, this another, is this another indication of why we really need to have a, a supervi supervisory level employee food director? So Carl, I think it's a combination of those factors. I think the budgeting process for food service has not been solid throughout the supervisory union throughout the last several fiscal years. I think it's important that the food service managers at each of our building level um, this next fiscal year, they will be working with me more closely on establishing a budget based on historical factors that have come into play throughout the last several years. So we will look at the last several years to see where their budgets are off. One of the big factors that I found is that we are not charging enough for our paid meal prices. So each year we have to do what is called the paid lunch equity tool. We were not aware that it hadn't been done for the prior fiscal year until I went through the food service audit and got the food service results last August that we needed to do that. So upon completion of that, it was found again that our numbers were below. And then this year when I did our renewal application, that is now a function of the renewal application, is that paid lunch equity tool the recommendation based on our numbers is that we charge a minimum of $3.05 for paid lunch, but you're not allowed by USDA guidelines to increase your paid lunch price by more than 10 cents in any one school year. So we have several buildings that are still down in the 285, 295 range. So we're, we're low in several of our entities as far as what we're charging for paid lunch. And then, you know, the, the actual reimbursement rates that we get, they came out late last fiscal year. We do have them for this fiscal year. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, following and understanding those budgets and working more closely with the food service managers. I do, you've all heard me say multiple times throughout this past year when I've been blessed to be the school food authority that we absolutely need to change the way we are handling our school food accounts. It should all be maintained at the supervisory union level. That would give us the opportunity for bulk buying purchases and for better tracking purposes. And as far as, you know, having that same consistent pricing throughout the supervisory union, I do think food service is one of the, the places that we need to put some focus in. I do know that Jamie mentioned in a prior board meeting his desire to obtain some bids as far as putting our food service out to a contractor. So I think that's definitely something that we will look into in the future as, as well. But there are definitely some places in the food service that we need to be paying closer attention to. And the fact mm -hmm. that the general fund needs to offset any deficits that we have in the food service that perhaps we need to be looking at what you're allocating now in your budget cycle to supplement your food service programs and if we need to make adjustments there. I know last year many people just um, continued to do what they had done in the past, which clearly wasn't enough because we still ended up with a deficit. So I think there's multiple right. factors that we need to look at when it comes to food. I, I would love us to have some sort of analysis about how much money we've been leaving on the table in terms of not getting our full FDA reimbursements or not doing uh, appropriate purchasing or appropriate recipe and meal planning. Um, I remember a similar argument being made a couple of years ago about that, and we didn't have this kind of data when we came into the budget cycle. And as we're going into the budget cycle, it would be great to understand what, because it, it, it seems like we have this conversation that we should have an SU food service coordinator most every year. And we say, well, that's a lot of money to pay, to pay someone to do that for us. And then we all pay deficits. So I would really like us to see some sort of, some sort of uh, analysis of what savings or maybe not savings could be had or what we're going to do to try to not run these consistent food service def deficits and still give wellness. Because I do not believe the answer is to tr serve everything out of a Cisco can or out of some sort of central kitchen that's shipping out uh, um, you know, warming trays. 
Well, I, I do think that there is some, some, some not all food, food service programs are serving things out of a warming tray and looking at the deficit that everybody has, maybe it's time to at least revisit and get some solid numbers on what we could actually save. I'm curious how um, a, a supervisory union managed food service is going to affect local purchasing, because I agree, I, I think sometimes economy is going to um, affect quality. And if we're trying to improve or grow our farm to school program and local buying, I'm just curious how that's going to affect us. Well, I feel like these are an additional agenda item for an upcoming meeting. But what I can tell you is, is that my experience is whether we centralized food service and did it ourselves or whether we went out to contract that local buying and purchasing at a bulk way still happens. The example I can give you is that I previously worked with the Abbey Group. We still bought potatoes from the local farmer in Williamstown, but we were able to do it via bulk buying through Chappelle's. And if you haven't had their potatoes, I recommend you do. They're great potatoes. And they also helped us write the grant for the farm to school program. So I think it's something that you guys got to wrestle with as a board at a very soon to be uh, upcoming agenda, because we there's some big decisions there in regards to the contract and getting a sense of what those numbers look like. But until we have someone take a look and provide us with that information, it's hard for you to make an informed decision on what we could do locally versus someone else coming in. But what I can tell you is schools are not in the business to run food service programs in order to come close to breaking even. That's not what we were trained to do. And so right now, the problem is we don't have that oversight in regards to ensuring that the recipes, that the promotion, that the free and reduced lunch paperwork and all that's handled in a way that ensures the most efficient system. And that's what we got to figure out, whether we're going to do that in-house or whether we're going to have someone help us with that. And that's what I need you guys to help decide. I need some direction on whether you want me to pursue that or not and an upcoming agenda. Um, <clears throat> Tara, question on this slide, reasons for projected deficits. Is this prioritized or just, a, a, I mean, is there, was HRA one of the biggest issues, or is it not also equally? Reason. It was just all the potential reasons compiled into a list. It's not in a, this is the primary number one reason. It's not in any of that kind of order. Is it possible that we could get that? Because I think that would focus well, more. I mean, our, I'll in. We know that at the SU level around our deficit, our two major, major, major issues is special education, okay, and that there were times we were over projecting federal revenue. And that was some um, just miscommunication within the SU office of when we were budgeting federal revenues, that we were overstating them in some local districts during the budget process, and or essentially the same dollar was counted in two places for as revenues stated in your budgets. And so at the SU level, those are two major issues. Also, HRA was, of course, under budgeted. For everybody throughout the entire supervisory union, including central office and including special education. So we had already identified that as an issue last year when we went through the budgeting cycle for FY21. That's why I made the recommendations that I made and you as boards decided how you wanted to move forward. And that will continue to be an issue if we end up with higher utilizations than you know what the average was at that point. So that will always be something that we need to watch very closely as I expressed to you all when we were building your FY21 budgets, that ultimately the goal would be to build up an HRA reserve fund eventually so that we protect us on the years that we have higher utilization versus the years that we don't have as much utilization. And then with the statewide negotiated contracts, HSAs are now going to be a factor for us as well, starting in January of 2021. So that will be another factor that we're going to need to budget for in 2022, depending on they can choose between an HRA, which again is a health reimbursement arrangement, 
or a health savings account, which is the HSA. So they do have those options in the new statewide negotiated health plan. So that will continue to be something that we will visit each year and we'll get those utilization reports to try and make the best decisions that we can for the budgets. Um, an another way of prioritizing, if I may say, it would be nice to know what is the, S the SU level problems and what are the individual. I'm just gonna say that, Ethan. So okay. why you're getting this as an SU is because in general, your deficits are caused, being caused by reassessments from the SU. So the supervisory union is overrunning budgets in regards to the SU budget and then more specifically special ed has been traditionally and the auditors are on here, they can confirm this for you. And then that's being reassessed back out. And so many of your local district re uh, budget shortfalls started with the SU and our reassessments. And as you can see, as we're projecting currently right now in fiscal year 20, it's almost a half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. You're at, that's gonna be assessed back out to you all by your percentages. And so therefore those numbers, you can look right now, Rudd's, Rudd's doing well, they're in the black. That's not gonna happen once we reassess back out. And so at the local level, the issue that we see mostly affecting us has to do with preventative maintenance and the cost for contracted services in regard to maintaining our buildings, Ethan. And so at the local level, that's an area that we're gonna try to hyper-focus on because that's, it's one of the reasons I did a tour over the last two weeks of every building. And what became clear to me is in many places, we're still reacting to when something breaks and we don't have preventative plans in place for preventative maintenance and or our reserve accounts really are not in place after the merger. And then, you know, we also had the big bit crew come out last year. So between Jamie's walkthroughs with your facility maintenance directors and with what was discovered by Visbit, it really gives us the jumping off point on building that uh, replacement plan for your facilities. And with the Visbit reports, as you all may re recall when you received them, that they did put them in order of priorities so that it helps you to know what really needs to be done now versus you know what's a low priority. So by using all of that information, we can really help develop that maintenance plan for your for each of the building. Okay, Carl, you had something um, that I, I thought I, I thought I understood that like our SUD, our line was that line you showed on that on that table. And that we also were responsible for our share of that bottom line for the SU. But now it seems like you're saying that our SU piece is already shown. No, no, no. no I'm saying that those numbers you see for fiscal year 20 above WRVSU are pre us ass assessing that dollar out. So we we should expect that we would pay our 14 percent or whatever our okay. SU is. SU of that SU bottom line. Correct. Um, how close, obviously this is, this is, a lot of this is new information. How close are you to giving us some idea of what the savings will be with efficiencies in special ed and federal estimating? Well, we've got the next slide, we've got some rough estimates of where we're headed. Can we finish this slide? There was a couple okay. of slides we didn't touch on. So Jamie mentioned the over projection of federal revenue and grants and Medicaid and special education. We are over in contracted services. There are budget shortfalls in the occupational therapy salaries and overspending in the remind me speech speech right. language pathology. Thank you. I couldn't remember the first one. Um, and then one of the big things as your building administrators, you know, they dread the annual budget. Uh, sped, uh, regular special ed paras, regular ed bill backs. So that is something some of them try to budget for based on what they know they're going to need to use for regular ed services of their special education paras. But there are instances throughout the school year where things happen 
-hmm. And based on the time studies, you know, that can change what is actually can, what we can claim for reimbursement under special ed versus what has to be billed back to the entities for using those paras in regular education ways. We talked about the HRA. Jamie talked about the reactive maintenance and replacement plan. And then one of the other areas that we seemed to be a lot over budget under was uh, the need for substitutes. And that often points to a climate and culture issue. And then we did talk about the budget process for food service. So upon you know our initial review of where overages were, this is a quick snapshot to give you some ideas of where the projected deficits are coming from. Obviously, when each of you receive your own report, we can go through and see what your individual entity, where their areas were. But this was just, you know, common general factors that we discovered throughout this process. Um, Tara, yeah? when you say uh, budget overfalls in, regu in regular education use of regular education usage of SPED paras, do you mean for 504 program support or you just mean for plain old regular education because at least at least in, in our, our, our district, we at one point in time got, got dinged because we had a para who was straightening in the classroom and straightening in the classroom with a regular classroom expense um, versus the idea that we've got paras that are providing 504 services and 504 services are paid for by the local education authority. I'm going to refer you, that answer to Don Carl. He's more equipped to answer that for you. Uh, what, uh, what, what we found was uh, the, the, the uses of the special ed parents doing a lot more regular ed duties um, in, or in a classroom. Uh, when we did this um, time study analysis, what we're finding is, um, I'm going to try to say this in the simplest ways because it gets confusing. When we do time studies, we, when a pair is working with a kid, they have to um, have to do what's prescribed in the IEP. For instance, if a student is uh, has a math uh, weakness disability, and the IEP calls three times a week for 20 minutes, 20 minutes three times a week, we have people doing. 40 minutes, five times a week. Uh, that's just an, a made up example, but that's the stuff that we're, we're finding. We're also finding that uh, parents were working with, uh, with uh, <clears throat> students and providing services that weren't even in the IEP. For instance, if he had a reading disability, they're, they're helping him in math class. Or if there was a, um, a group of students and they say small group instruction, there might be, uh, the majority of the kids have to be on IEPs. We're finding that they, they weren't. So all kinds of irregularities that we're going to uh, kind of pull together a training before our next uh, staff meeting or, or before October anyway, uh, and train the, the, not only the, the teachers, but also the principals. So when they look at their time studies, because they have to review these uh, and sign off on them, uh, that they know what they're looking at. So it, 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 it's not 504 support, it's actually general tutorial support. It's general reading, blah, 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 um, math or whatever, or it's supports that aren't directly under an IEP that we're providing to uh, uh, try to help the whole student and not just the parts of the student that the federal government says we're allowed to support. And, that and Carl, we're cool with that. We just got to make certain that we're budgeting accordingly for it. And right, right, right. And, and, and I understand. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to understand if this is a management, if this is if this is something where we're doing a better job of planning and plotting and organizing, so that we can expect that we're not going to have these kinds of deficits going forward because we're doing a better job of of of, of understanding and organizing our our paras and our, our our sped instructors' time, versus this is still something that we should just uh, I I expect because. You know, we're trying to meet the needs of the student, and that may mean that, you know, we're we're, we're providing a, a different support, a 504 support or a tutorial support, and and we're okay with that because we're supporting the whole student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're, we're in agreement that you know kids need to help. That's why these parents are in the business of helping kids. We just have to identify if if. Uh, the time they're going to be working with regular ed kids, 504 kids, or ESD uh, clan kids, 
we just got to identify that and make sure that we're budgeting accordingly and not say, well, we got this amount of money, but we're, you know, this amount of money in the budget, but we're going to spend this amount, you know? We got we to know that prior. Don, can you exp just explain to them about time studies? Uh, Bob asked Don to explain about time studies, just so you know. Are you, are you aware of time studies? Okay, we, they happen, there's two weeks out of the year that they happen, and they're in, it's October and February. And what happens is they, everyone who is paid under the uh, special ed umbrella uh, has to do them. And what it is, is it's a snapshot in time of a schedule. And so if a paraeducator has to document exactly what they are doing in each, uh, you know, you know, from, from the, the start of their contract of hours to the end of their contracted hours. And what happens is that the state comes in and does an audit. And if they find um, in those two weeks that uh, a paraeducator um, went over uh, the services in an IEP, for instance, they're applying math 20 minutes three times a week, which uh, should be two times a week, they will deduct that, that salary for the whole year. So we have to be, as I always say, we got to be creative but not fraudulent when we do our time studies. And that, you know, we, you know, again, when we're teachers, we're working in a, in a school and little Sally, who's not on an IEP asks for help. We're not going to, we're not going to not help her. We're going to help her, but we can't do that over a consistent period of time, day in and day out, month in and uh, month out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anything? Next, Sarah. So the next slide, when Ray gets it back up on the screen, is what have we done for FY 2021 to try and make sure this doesn't continue to happen? So the first one is that I am now overseeing grants, Medicaid, and special education, where before that was primarily done by the individuals who handle that. So now I am very much involved in the decisions and watching the spending and approving the spending and being part of the spending and re revenue process for them. Grants will be written with a team approach moving forward. So we will be working based on our goals throughout the supervisory union. We'll be working with Mary Ellen in curriculum, Don in special education, each of the building administration administrators and Cynthia and myself and Jamie will be working as a team each year and Ray when it has anything to do with technology or technology usage to establish what we need our federal funds for and how we're going to spend them based on you know the goals of the supervisory union liability reconciliations will be done on a monthly basis not on a, at fiscal year end so what so that means Tara, can you just can clarify what liability reconciliation is yes yeah, that's what i was just going to say so liability accounts are for example when we deduct health insurance from an employee's paycheck we have to reconcile to make sure the appropriate amount of money is taken out and that appropriate amount of money is then offset and sent to the insurance company to cover their 20% of their health insurance premium. So historically, it appears that that was being done at the end of the year, which as all of you have seen, most likely in your last week's warrants and what your warrants will be this year, that it was done at year end. So there are some additional charges for any cleanup. So Additional liability accounts would be the long-term disability insurance that the supervisory union paid on behalf of the districts and then need to get the money back from the districts. The HRA accounts, making sure that the money that was paid out by data path is in fact what we paid data path. So there's a lot of moving pieces in the behind the scenes accounts through in our software system that need to be reconciled on a monthly basis. So I've instructed the business office staff that that is my expectation, is that is done every month moving forward and no longer at fiscal year end. Tara, this yep. is Don. Are we also gonna be reconciling um, leave time so that the employees know exactly what they have? Yes, that is one of the things that they need to be reconciling on a monthly basis, Don. Okay. 
So we've shifted roles within the business office. Uh, several of you have heard that I have a new payroll administrator that started on June 1st, Robin Duniken. She is up and running. Um, Anne is still here with us as a part-time accountant, handling the monthly billing of the benefit line items and also still being available for Robin as a resource. Particularly this week, you know, it's the beginning of the school year. We start payroll for all of the teachers. So to make sure that what they selected for their weekly pay cycles is set up correctly in the system, that the salaries are set up correctly, we'll be sending out to the administrators once it's all established to again confirm that the appropriate account code is being used for payroll, as you all recall. In the last two years, there have been several positions that were miscoded. So you ended up having a substantial salary increase overage in general elementary, where you had a substantial reduct or surplus in the middle school level. So to make sure that all of the individuals are appropriately coded. So that's some of the work that Ann will also be working with Robin to do in addition to quarterly reports. Um, Rose, she is handling all general ledger functions of the business office on her side. So that's bank reconciliations, um, accounts receivable, postings, and then Jane handles all of our grants and special education accounting right now. So she confirms that purchases and expenditures that are being applied to grants match the strategies that the grants were written on to make sure that we can actually get the reimbursement funding from the state and feds when it's a federal grant. And then in special education, she just maintains the expenditure report. She does the initial draft of the special education expenditure reports, and then I review it and sign off on it. So that's her primary function at, right, at this point. And then um, myself as the school food authority and as the business manager, what I oversee on my side. Johanna continues to be our accounts payable clerk. And then Lisa is our human resource administrator slash administrative assistant to the business office. So that's where we currently stand. As far as the business office, Lori is still our Medicaid clerk and Tracy is still the special education administrative assistant. So they still work very closely with the business office on making sure all of those things run smoothly. So that's the current status of the business office and bank reconciliations because now that we have capacity with rose being here bank reconciliations as you saw in the draft continuous improvement plan that i submitted to the full board that um they are now being done on the monthly basis that they need to be within the 21 days of the close of the month we get the bank statements from the banks and then rose works with the treasurers to get all the back, backup documentation that's needed for deposits that were made by the treasurers so that we can reconcile all of the, I think we're up to 28 bank accounts right now. So bank reconciliation takes a lot of time. My goal is to get some of those extra bank accounts closed because there is no reason why we should have 28 bank accounts throughout the supervisory union. So it's a lot of work to reconcile and it takes you know a good week of time to reconcile all those bank accounts. That's given that every piece of documentation is at hand and she can move right through it. But there is a lot of back and forth between her and the treasurers in order to obtain that documentation to make sure the reconciliations go through the way they need to go through. We created a finance committee in RUD and in FBUD and Jamie and I have discussed also trying to create an SU finance committee in the near future. So we'll be coming back to you all for that. And on the next slide, we'll review what the roles and responsibilities are of the finance committee. Jamie mentioned earlier that we're changing the budget process. I submitted a draft timeline to you all as part of my business manager's report. So this year we are starting from zero and building up. It's, we're not going to use, this is what we did last year. So this is what we're gonna do this year. So we are literally going to start from nothing and build it based on needs and necessities. And we're going to be building it in segments as you'll see, or if you haven't already read the budget timeline. We changed the PO procedure, which is purchase orders. All purchase orders that are over $1,000 for any entity within the supervisory union, Jamie has to approve. The person making the purchase order request has to be able to substantiate the need for that order. And then here within the supervisory union and within RUD, 
I will be reviewing and improving all purchase orders prior to the orders being placed. And then restructuring. And the reason for that is to make sure that we have the funds available in the budget and that it really is a necessity. As you all know, we froze all spending unless it was a necessity. So that just continues to help solidify that process and to make sure it's being followed. And then the restructuring and special education, Don touched on some of this already in his report. So principals are now the LEAs. We're no longer using a leadership team. So that was a projected savings of $56,000. We have changed some of the contracted psychological services that we were utilizing. That's a projected savings of $130,000. And the management decision not to fill two vacancies is an additional, additional projected $130,000 savings. And then Don has also put in place in his de department caps on individual services and supply orders of $200 and anything that exceeds that would require prior approval from him. And then Jamie and the appropriate administrator is analyzing every vacancy throughout the supervisory union to determine efficiency. And if there is a need for a replacement and in some of those situations, they've already determined that there is not a need for replacement and there's a projected $65,000 between salaries and benefits and some of those positions that we're not filling. And then those I, have all come to the local district board, just so folks know. And I am no longer contracting with my mentor, which is a projected savings of $57,000 over last year. Any questions on that slide? Go ahead, Ray. So this is the finance committee's roles and responsibilities. So during the finance committee meetings, we'll review the monthly expenditure reports and quarterly revenue reports. They will review the approved warrants for questions, concerns, or coding errors. It will be the place where we do the budget development prior to the monthly board meetings. And we'll go over again that budget development calendar and tool that I sent out in my board report. We're gonna look at monthly food service reports and then to review the facilities committee strategic plan for proactive maintenance that will be developed throughout this next school year is my understanding. Is that correct, Jamie? Yeah. So that's the roles and responsibilities of the finance committee. And then ultimately they would then come, your finance committee would then come to you as your board and present the information that was established during the finance committee meetings. So for RUD, we are meeting on the first Thursday of the month. And for First Branch, we still need to establish what our calendar is going to be. Could I ask how many people are on these various committees? So right now for RUD, we have two board members. And then we have the building administrators. And then they have invited two community members to be part of their finance committee. My understanding, and Bob can correct me if I'm wrong, they both are CPAs and are in the, the field of accounting so that they'll be a valuable resource to the boards and to the administrators to help with that understanding and making that transition between common language and accounting gobbledygook. Is that correct, Bob? Yes, you have three board members. Oh yeah, sorry, three board members in red. Thank you. Yeah, but has two. Thank you. <laughs> FBUD currently has two board members, but we haven't met to establish if they're going to have any ad additional members or not, or how they're going to handle that. And it will be their two building administrators as well. Okay. Is Thank there, you. I also have the auditors on because you just got provided a great deal of information. And I wanted to make certain that if you had questions, that you could ask them as well. And they've been working with us now. Uh, well, they worked in uh, Windsor Northwest. Uh, Northwest. I want to say Northeast. I'm going to get it down here. Windsor Northwest for several years. And they've been working with you for the last, since the merger. And so I was wanted to make certain that if you had questions or if you could say, is, uh, is what the administration just presented, what you guys are seeing in your analysis, that you would have the opportunity to do so. I would like to ask that question to the auditors. 
Um, so the auditors, do you feel that this is going to get us in the right direction? I mean, are, are these some of the recommendations that you have? Ron, you're on mute, I think. I can't hear you. Hmm. Doesn't show me. Can't hear you. Try and turn your volume up, Ron, and see if that will work. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. His browser may also be denying him permissions to use the microphone. He may need to go into his browser settings and turn on his microphone again. So Ron is the in charge of RHR Smith and Josh Quinn is our individual auditor. Just to give you context of who the two of them are. We still can't hear Ron. Yeah, Ron, we still can't hear you. Can you hear us, I guess? Yep. No, Ron, can oh. you hear us? No, okay. Then we don't know. Hey, can you coach him? Uh, Josh, can you unmute and see if we can hear you? Make sure it's not a problem just for outsiders. Ron, can you drop out and come right back? Josh, we can't hear you either. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm an, I'm an outsider. Oh, no, I guess I'm not an outsider. I am not an outsider. I'm sorry. Josh, we can't hear you either. Maybe drop out and come back. Uh-oh, right? Unmute. Ron, there you go. No. Nope. Oh, this is frustrating. <laughs> Maybe try calling in with the phone number. What's the number? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Josh. We got you, Josh. All right, good. Um, well, I'll just start while Rob tries to fix his IT problems. Um, so, yes, yeah, I guess to respond to your question, yes, these are all uh, uh, Items we have recommended and then some that I think Tara and Jamie have probably come up with themselves. Uh, and definitely uh, something, especially from a budgeting perspective, you guys talked a lot about food service. Um, always a challenge um, to budget food service when a lot of schools across the state have food service managers, for example, who are our cooks, our chefs, and do not uh, and have not ever been putting the budgets together and trying to follow budgets. Um, and special ed, uh, you talked a lot about the uh, regular ed, uh, para usage being built back. Also a common problem of just trying to get those budgets right and then having people follow those, um, <clears throat> follow the requirements of what they're supposed to do whenever possible, if possible. Uh, um, hold on a second. I think Ron's calling me. Let's see if he can jump in. Hold on. You just joined right. Ron, it's it's stars there. You go. <clears throat> can you hear me now? We got gotcha. you. We can. Now listen, we're having some nasty thunderstorms here. I don't know if that's affecting me. It didn't affect my uh, video, but I don't know about my audio. So, so Josh, J Josh, were you able to respond to the question? I think so. Um, did, did that help? Was that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and again, I would just listening to a lot of the conversation, the data that you guys are present, presenting, the one thing that I would say this week that I said last week is, is just us huddling up with Jamie and Tara and her group. There's been a lot of work done. We haven't really had a chance, you know, to get into 2020 yet, but I know that's a priority for Tara and Jamie, and it's a priority for us. And really, I think that, like I say, 19, with 19 to bed now, our focus is mainly on 20 to just confirm, you know, with Tara and make sure nothing was missed. You know, uh, the, 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 the presentation that her and her people spent a lot of time apparently uh, putting together for tonight to give you some data, focus on that, given the fact that that 19 is, is, is old. I'd want to know if I'm in your all chair, you know, right now. And, uh, and yeah, that's our focus point, as we told Jamie and Tara, and that's something certainly we have fast track for you all right now. And, and, and back to 
you know, the food service, I absolutely think, you know, uh, you know, that you guys are doing the right thing by taking a deeper dive into it. And, and Jamie and Tara, we can give you at least three to five other business managers who just recently within the past year just went through the same situation that you're in and the same dive you know, and reached out to Abby and Cafe. I believe one chose to sit tight, the other four decided to outsource. So may I recommend that you, you uh, allow us to connect you with some of your fellow business managers so that they can kind of give you the, you know, the, the down and dirty of what they did and why they did it. That would be awesome. Thank you, Ron. And so do you feel like with what's put in place here, we're doing everything that you're recommending so that we're not looking at this next year? I, I think you're doing everything that you're recommending. I think that your biggest uh, obstacle is going to be time. I think Rose was a great addition, as I said last week, to your, you know, to your staff. I think she's covered a lot of ground. I think that you're under-resourced still in that area. And I know when I sat in front of all you guys um, uh, back last uh, October, Halloween-ish, you know, one of the things that we advocated was getting uh, Tara some, some good accounting help in there. I think that as, you, as Jamie and Tara continue to look in the, the, the mirror at the BNA of their business office, I actually think that I'd be prepared to, you know, to really look at that hard and just look at the staffing, what you got right now, you know, and whether or not there's, uh, you know, the, the ability to shut, look at your details, look at your job, look at your people sitting in the chairs and, and try to get some uh, money freed up for other accounting. And I would trust that Jamie and Tara you know, I'm using us as a sounding board. I definitely think that that's going to be a need, you know, of your uh, of your supervisor union, which will allow Tara and give her the best chance, her and her staff, the best chance to implement the plan, you know, and the corrective action that we've been talking about now for a long time. And and, and with the with the strain that to 19, as I said, FY19 just posed a lot of huge challenges, you know, that uh, that Tara, Tara walked into. And I think staffing, and I think that that's something that needs to be looked at hard by the SU, too. You know, but I know Rose has done a Herculean effort to try to get that place caught up. I'm just worried that there's not enough time for her between now and, you know, say, October 15th, when we want to start talking about drafts and confirmation with you all. Um, I, I'm just afraid that there's not enough time, you know, and we're going to run out of time, and, and, and Tara won't have a chance to take that plan for a spin. That's, a, that, that's my biggest concern. And if, Josh, you want to respond, to, I'll let you respond to you know, to that as well. Oh, no, I think you covered it. Okay. Any other questions of the auditors? With this deficit, how are we able to maintain um, meet payroll, cash flow? We would use You're that. asking me? Is that yeah. question directed at us? Oh, okay, Ron. I can let you answer it or I can answer it, Ron. Uh, Tara, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that completely up to you. If you want me to take a, no, take a shot at it, I the question. So we would use our tax anticipation notes that we've already put in place. And if those are not enough to cover the expenditures in anticipation of tax revenue and the education funding coming in, then we would need to go to the banks and ask for short-term expenditure notes to cover those additional expenses if we don't have enough cash to cover them. we got to go to the voters to do that. You would need to go to the voters in some situations, may not necessarily in all. So I would need to research that to figure out. I don't think you can borrow money without going to the voters. Well, it's one of the articles that you pass already in your annual meetings is to allow the school district to borrow funds in anticipation, in anticipation of tax taxes. revenue. Yeah. So if because of COVID-19 and the state of Vermont allowing property taxes to be extended and the due dates for property taxes to be extended, that would also be a situation where you've already authorized your school board to do that on your behalf. So we may not have to go to the you're voters again to a, ask that question. So that's something I would need to research. You're definitely going to gonna sure. have a cash flow problem. Yeah, and I, and I completely concur. You, you, I think you have a cash flow problem probably right now that needed to be remedied by that boring. But there is a statute just to hop in here that allows you, provided that it's board in anticipation of taxes, you have one year to pay that back, and you do not need voter approval to do that. Just to, just to leave no doubt about that question. Yeah, that's the correct. Sure. And and you can when you have a when you have a formally, you know, when, when you have a formally decided deficit, you can without voter approval roll that deficit into a three year in, in into a three year note. Yeah, correct. And you can actually pass that deficit off municipalities within your school district. 
the options that you have, you know, uh, certainly that the statute allows you for. And, and, and just to kind of expand on it, I think that the other wild card, the other variable that nobody knows the answer to, and if anybody tried, I'm, and I'm getting tired, you know, listening to like the states respectively try to, you know, to, to talk their way out of some of the cash flow problems and put some kind of understanding out there and, and, and maybe, you know, I'm not going to say promises, but put these, you know, put these, um, you, you know, what's going to happen because of this COVID and how that's going to affect. Nobody knows what the financial future of government brings now because the federal government doesn't know they haven't passed that stimulus package three, four, and five, you know, that they've gotten. They've been working on it now for months. And I'm afraid that that's going to be done so late in the game. I think it's going to put a lot of pressure on local governments, including schools, you know, that, uh, you know, that's going to be a big wild card, you guys. I really think that. And that's why. You know, Tara needs the you know the the resources just to make sure that she can execute what these numbers are going to be. You know, and then add in the element possibly of any funding that doesn't come through the door. So, I'll just add to to complicate factors. We are concerned that the Ed uh, payment in September is going to be delayed. So, in the areas where we are having cash flow shortages, that's not going to be helpful. Yeah. I think we're going to see it, you all, is February and February. I think that that I think that there's still that, that, that if we're in the eye of the hurricane, I'm more worried about all the backside, you know, that hurricane coming in, and that's what I see right now. I don't think we've really seen, you know, any of that effect yet, and I'm afraid it's going to be January and February before government sees it from everything that I'm being told and seen out there. So and one of our other factors is we have three entities that did not three districts that did not have an approved budget when tax bills needed to go out. So they had to issue tax bills that weren't reflective of what their approved budget tax rates are going to be. So the revenue that the towns are going to receive for the education tax is going to be less than what it needs to be in order to get these approved budgets. So where we have two districts that just have their approved budget and still are in the 30 day reconsideration window, those town clerks had already had to issue their tax bills because they were due. And then we just ran into the same situation in first branch where they do not have an approved budget. Their town clerks had to issue their tax bills based on a $1 tax rate times their CLA. And whatever their budget ends up being, the town's gonna have to then issue a secondary tax bill so that will also delay tax revenue coming in. So in those three entities where we had that situation, they will also experience potential cash flow issues because they're not getting the appropriate funding. Also, Tara, is that, is, is, Tara, is that confirmed that they'll reissue a supplemental tax bill? That is what the tax department indicated, that once the okay. approved budget has gone through, that they will need to reissue an adjusted tax bill. Where did they get the dollar tax rate? That's set by the Treasurer's Department, and it's what's in statute, that it's $1 times your CLA when you don't have an approved budget. Now, Becky said she didn't use that number. I don't know what Becky used. That was my conversation with her this morning, and I referred her to the tax department to get some guidance. Okay. Because that really is something she needs to go over with the tax department. It's good news for us, because they're going to be so happy in jumping with something. <laughs> I know I haven't seen my tax bill yet. <laughs> What have we else, what else we have on the agenda for tonight, folks? Well, any more any more questions of the auditors? Okay, I'm not sure where Jamie went. Um, Thank you, Ron and Josh, for joining us tonight. Kara, we'll be we'll be working close soon, so just holler when you're ready to uh, ready to engage. Awesome. You're welcome, Thanks, Ron. Take care. See you tomorrow. Take care, all. See ya. All right. Um, any other questions of Tara for the financial update? Tara, have you put the budget into the computer yet? Are we operating against the budget? The budgets are tentatively in, but they didn't load. So I have an email out to IV. I'm working on them. So they're, they're keyed We've in. We've got two months of paying bills, and that's not, that's not recorded against the budget. It would be, yes. But it's not. It will be, yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear the well, conversation right and now. The budget is in there. It will be against the budget. It, right now, it's looking as paid, and it's showing that you had zero dollar budgeted, and that you're overspent what your expenditures were for the month of July. That's what it shows right okay. now when I generate an expenditure report because the budget isn't pulling into the expenditure report. Okay, and that's so how long I, before that's going to happen? I emailed IB again today. 
Right. So, um, Jamie, proposed budget calendar. Uh, so there's a proposed budget calendar in your packets. Um, what we look to do is, and we ran this by the RUD uh, Finance Committee, just to get some feedback from them, Deal. is that we would take the budget chunk by chunk. And so, my eyes are not great, right? I think it's in my packet, just a minute. That we would break it down by student support originally, by district, and across the SU, and that that would occur in October. So student support would encompass special education, interventionists that are funded via our, our federal grants, positions, for example, behavioral analysts, MTSS personnel, uh, student support specialists, anything that has to do with targeted or intensive interventions, not universal instruction, not classroom instructors, but interventionists would come before you in um, October. You would provide us feedback just on that part of the budget. We'd have a discussion. We would then go back and work on that part of the budget based on feedback provided by the board. Meanwhile, we're also developing for a presentation in November, all regular ed and general ed education that best supports programming. So in November, you're gonna get two pieces of your budget, student support, which is a huge chunk, and regular ed. Essentially, by the end of November, you've got a good solid 80% of your budget for feedback on. We then go, and work in December to finalize the rest of the pieces of the budget, specifically around facilities, operations, SU assessment. In December, we will look for final feedback based on those three components that have been broken out. And we would re review the warning. The idea would be that no later than January, we formally adopted the budget and that we're moving forward for plannings of informational meetings, pre-town meeting, annual meeting, et cetera. And so this is the timeline that we'd like to propose that the board take action on across the SU so that it's consistent, so that my business office knows how they're going about approaching the budget. And what I can tell you is, is that the reasoning for this is I believe we don't know what's in our current budgets, line item to line item. And I think that what we've done is we said, this is what we had last year. So let's start there and then build from that. What I'd rather we do is say, what do we need to do to best support students through student support? And what, what are the goals of that outcome? Then we look and analyze, what do we need universally for instruction? And we propose that. So instead of trying to do the budget all at once, we would break it down in chunks. And I will also tell you that at the budget table, it would be members of central office supporting principals in the development of the budget. Um, and that will ensure, like with student support, Cynthia's at the table, Mary Ellen's at the table, Don's at the table, Tara's at the table, so that when we go to budget federal revenues within student support, that those funds equate to the FTEs you budgeted locally. Because that is one of the areas where we've had an issue, is we've said we're gonna budget a point for interventionists, but what's been budgeted in the, in the federal grant might be a sum money amount that doesn't equate to the point for with benefits. And so that's why, we, we're gonna tackle that part first, is we know that student support right now is the area that we've had the most issues within our budget process, special ed and the budgeting of federal monies to support interventionists. So we wanna tackle that number one. Do you want a motion to approve this now? Uh, I would love you guys to give us an approval. I think that we need to be transparent about how we do it so that we can move forward and get a strong game plan in place. Did Don have a question? I do. I, I, I got to confess, I didn't have a chance to review it completely, 
when is the SU budget going to be put to bed so the individual budgets can be focused on? Right now we're developing and presenting the SU budget to the SU board in October. Did you hear okay. that, Don? I can hear yeah, October, Don, so we know that the assessment- is that, on, is that on the list? What's that? That's on the list? Yeah, yeah. it's what's highlighted okay. in blue, Don, under October. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Does that make sense? It does because yes. Although what 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 are the what are the towns that don't have meetings until June gonna do? Well we said this schedule may differ differ for districts whose budget votes are not on or around town meeting day. Right. Yeah, but Rochester, Stockbridge, and Grenville and Hancock meet in May. So we could extend this out a bit, but I'll work with those local boards. But my my suggestion would be that we try to stay in alignment um, just because my hope would be that we become really efficient at this at the business office, right? We know this month we're doing this and those meetings are scheduled and we're hyper-focused on those areas. And I don't know what said in Jihad, please weigh in, but. Um, well, just a question. What are the, what are the variables? I think you mentioned this before, obviously the, I, I don't remember what it's called, but the big number that the state gives us it's supposed to be in December doesn't come, didn't come till May this year. That's our um, equalized pupil and our average daily membership and yeah. the property yield and the non-residential tax rate. Those are all factors when we're developing your tax rates that we need to wait until the AOE releases that. But we can build your necessities and your needs prior to having that information. And then obviously once we get that information, we would calculate where your tax rate stands. Okay. So you can, it, it doesn't, you can still keep to this schedule even without that. that well, what it would do is it's gonna adjust your tax rate. And so when you guys see that, you may say, hey, we felt really good about this, but due to the fact that we lost equalized pupils, we gotta go back and find something. And so, I mean, that's where the adjustment would come based on that. It wouldn't change what you were discussing about the needs for programming are, or where we're able to find efficiencies. Right. The biggest thing, the biggest thing in the past for us has been in many cases, how many kids are going to Rutland and how many kids are going to Sharon Academy because Sharon Academy holds its independent school tuition at the union school district, which is below the um, Royalton and Woodstock and Randolph um, uh, tuitions and Rutland is super low. And we've traditionally had some families that have gone that way. So what it's benefited us in the past has been, is just having an understanding of where, because we can't control where our families send their, send their kids. They can go wherever they want and that's fine. That's the law. But w having an idea that we're putting this many kids in, in, in Rutland or TSA versus this many kids in Woodstock or Randolph um, matters very much to our particular district. So Carl, the numbers that we would be using in November would be projected numbers because the districts don't have to set their announced tax rate by statute until January 15th. So we wouldn't have the solid numbers as to what announced tuition would be and what the state average tuition would be until after January 15th. But Which we is have why we have our meeting in May. Numbers. Mm. That's yeah, why we, we have, 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 have a lot of other sending districts that we, you know, we not we don't have that situation. We don't have that luxury. Of and money. I would always say we should be budgeting conservatively to ensure that we don't cut ourselves short on anticipated expenditures in that area. No, I I think it's a really sound plan to get this budget in form however in hearing the auditors just recently i think we're going to be finding numbers coming from the state lacking come february march i don't think they know what the hell they're going to do frankly i, I so. think that's true also but i think we have to do our work business oh, oh, yeah, i agree so does somebody want to make a motion to approve the budget timeline do we want more discussion on it more time I would make a motion to to go with the designed budget plan outline. So Second. seconded. Any more discussion on it? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You guys have it. 
Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, Jamie, WRVSU revised goals and CIP. So, uh, Mary Ellen can jump in. I mean, I'm looking for you guys to give us permission to really utilize those three goals I outlined in my report as the overarching goals for our work as we move forward for the next three years. They align nicely to most of the tasks within your guys' prior strategic plan. We did a crosswalk and took the task and aligned them to those overarching goals. The tasks have started to be um, revised at the SU level based on the admin team. We did some of that during the admin retreat. You will get a finalized document for review, feedback, and approval in the future. But I at least want to have something that we can say to faculty and staff, this is the overarching work ahead of us. And also for us to start reporting out on so that you can hold us accountable to them. Like what measures are you taking to get us there? And then Mary Ellen can jump into where we're currently at in the CIP process. So right now we're putting together the supervisory union CIP and we're using those three goals that Jamie outlined as the framework for setting that up. So one of them is academic proficiency. One of them deals with the MPSS and the safe and healthy schools. And the third one is the equity area. Those are the three that we're using. And so CIP, you know, you know, it's continuous improvement plan. It's required by the agency of education. And that, that should, with our data analysis, drive how we're using federal monies. And so this was a another accountability measure that the agency have had put in place to ensure continuous improvement, but to also say your investment should be toward these goals. Right? Like you're not just spending money willy nilly. But the way you're using your federal funds should be to support these overarching goals. And so we're trying to change this process significantly to say to principals and to teachers and staff, what's your data telling you and where do you need to invest? And one of the things you hear us say in student support, just because we have invested money this way the last five years, doesn't mean it's necessarily the way we need to invest money moving forward. We need to analyze and drill down and say, what is it we need? And so we're going to try to do that drill down earlier and not later in the game so that it's used as part of the budget process. Any questions on that? Okay. Can I make a point? Yeah. Well, I believe strongly in academic freedom protection. Can't hear you. Uh, feel strong can't hear you. About academic freedom for teachers, and I'm not certain what he means by that, but I, I will say that we certainly try to say to teachers, here's the tools you need, let's implement them to get students to these ends. And so we don't say this is the program and you gotta fit just so you know, Bob, we don't say you gotta be on chapter two, page five on such and such a day. What we say is here's the ends by grade level, you need to get students. And I think it, one of the things we got to do a better job is how do we define curriculum? And curriculum is not defined by programs. It really should be defined by your guys' ends at grade level that you guys have done so, more, so much work on in regards to your proficiency work. So do I have a motion to approve the WRVSU revised goals and CIP? So moved. So moved. Seconded. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, hearing none, see how it's happened. Um, COVID-19 update, Jamie. Uh, so as far as COVID-19 updates go, um, the administrators and teams of teachers continue to work diligently to ensure a safe and effective reopening. Thursday night, we have a virtual academy meeting. We've worked out the final details around staffing the virtual academy today. The numbers increased a bit over the last four days, so we had to make some adjustments at the elementary level. Um, CARES money has covered any expenses we've incurred thus far for COVID-19. 
Um, we're feeling confident about that. Tara and I are continuing to work on the grant. We're submitting that next week. One of them. That is for the CRF funds. The ESSER funds is later on. So we have two buckets of money that we're working from. Two buckets of money for CARES fund. And don't ask me what CRF stands for versus the other, because I don't know at this point, Don. There's been a lot in my mind. I just know I got to get this grant done with Tara. And what we're doing, just so you know and you're aware, is we try to prioritize staff who would be qualified under the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act to staff the virtual academy. And so we've been successful to do, at doing that for the most part. There was one more elementary teacher that we had to secure within the SU, and we prioritized that person based on current student enrollment once we found out the virtual academy numbers. We're trying to do this without incurring additional costs to any district or the SU, just so you know. Jamie, question oh, about... Oh. What's that, Ethan? Oh, yeah, sorry. A uh, question about CARES. Um, any, any chance in your estimation we could be left holding the bag here, that this money won't be what we expect it to be? We have a, we have a sense of, of currently right now what they're estimating the money will be. Until that money is in my account, our accounts, I don't know what to expect. Are we, but the legislature I mean, obviously is we... coming back in session. They gave us an approximate dollar amount, and that's what we're working on, but we try to be really conservative with it. Mm. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just worried, you know, that we, if we are spending money and, it, and we get left holding the bag, as I say, but... Well, we, so you, we've tried to limit expenditures as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to come underneath that number um, with, I mean, we're looking at trying to come, Tara and I talked about the idea that we're trying to come under that number by around 90,000 at the moment, because we don't want to incur costs that then we don't have the revenue for. And we're not in a financial state that we can do so. And What's our total estimation of what we're um, hoping or uh, spending from CARES right now? Do we have a number on that? What we're currently expensed? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, ha have we gotten any money yet at all? Or No we... money yet at all. Okay. So what is our total as far as what, we've, what we're anticipating or thinking about spending from CARES money? Because I know well, like I our speak to that, but I think strategically that might not put us in a great place. I'm just going to speak to that in a public okay. meeting to okay. release that money at this time, that amount at this time, because we are trying to be very conservative with that. Very good. If the board wants me to speak to that. I can, but I just advise that that might not make sense to do right now publicly. Jamie, speaking to the virtual academy, do you feel like we have we have the resources we need to support that? We've got, you know, I, I know Lindy is is uh, leading that as the virtual principal of the virtual academy. Are we in a good place with that? Do we need more resources for that? Are we stretching Lindy too thin and she's going to be yelling at me in my next board meeting? <laughs> she can't Lindy will yell at me. She are we are we in good or are we just overview? Are we in, in, in good good shape for that? I'm feeling comfortable at this time. We're in good shape. I'm looking at Mary Ellen. I mean, Mary Ellen and Amy Toth have been doing a lot of work with this too, behind the scenes to support the academy. Uh, myself, I mean, I've been I was in contact with Lindy two or three times today around the academy. There's been staff meetings already happening for the virtual academy. There's an informational le uh, letter went out to those families and an invite to Thursday evening for our virtual academy informational meeting specific to those parents and students um, that Lindy and I will be putting on in place of the regular weekly virtual academy, uh, the regular weekly WRVSU info nights, of which by the way, have had of over 40 in attendance the last two weeks. So that's great in addition to the local meetings. But the virtual academy meeting will happen Thursday night. And what we're looking to do is a flipped classroom so that staff will tape their mini lessons. They will then, that will be presented within the instructional block, but also folks can access via the Google Classrooms, the platform we're using for the Virtual Academy, by the way. Those, those lessons can be accessed anytime in the Google Classroom. Then within the block specified, like let's say nine to 1030 is literacy, 
Teachers will be then providing reinforcement in mini lessons based on reinforcement on the mini lesson that was already provided taped. Now let's say a family says that time doesn't work for me. We're also providing office hours in the afternoon. So that reinforcement could also happen. And Great. That's that's the place where I've where I've I've gotten community feedback is just what's this virtual academy going to be like? We understand what what you know. I've gotten positive comments around you know outdoor classrooms. The kids are going to be in school full day that or, or full week. That's great. It's the, the the questions I've I've heard have been like. So what's this virtual academy going to be out be like? And can Lindy do that if she's teaching my kids in Stockbridge too? So and thank all you. the teachers that we have are just devoted to the virtual academy, except for when we get to 7th through 12. At the high school level, teachers have been assigned virtual academy blocks. And at the middle school level, we've, we've um, assigned virtual academy blocks based on staffing that had capacity. So instead of having, let, I'm just going to throw out a number, instead of having four preps in person, you teach three classes and one virtual. So instead of maybe having two sections of Algebra 1, both in person, there's one section of Algebra 1 in person, one section of Algebra 1 virtual. Okay. And part of the delay in us releasing the information is we wanted teacher feedback. And it took me, I've been meeting in a lot of HR meetings, and it took me until this past Friday to know exactly what teaching staff we had for WRBSU. I didn't want to, the academy, I didn't want to assign teachers to it. Um, and then we we're all of a sudden looking to replace teachers. Do you see what I'm saying? I tried to look at who enrolled for students, where do we have capacity across the SU, and what teachers would qualify for a reasonable accommodation for the academy. And then Lindy wanted to make certain the plan we were rolling out made sense to that group of teachers. So that's why that one piece has been a bit delayed. And I understand it has been, um, but we're trying to get ahead of it now the best we can. Um, Jamie, I'm, I'm sure you answered this question somewhere else uh, in great detail. Uh, what does the whole SU go on to virtual academy if suddenly we go virtual? I've heard there's talk about possibly delaying coming back to school after Christmas break. Well, so we're planning for uh, lots of different phases, okay. right? Like yeah. if the event that all of a sudden COVID blows up in a particular school, and all these decisions will be made in consultation with the Department of Health, right? Mm -hmm. So we would contact Trace number one. Number two, we would then get advice from the Department of Health, and then we would make determinations based on that building. So the only way the full SU would shut down is in the event that COVID numbers have gone up in Vermont or gone up here locally and in co consultation with the Department of Health, they've recommended we need to do so, of which I would pull an emergency meeting together and inform you guys. So there's right now, we are focused on outdoor learning for the first nine weeks with the idea that we're we are building up stamina for the use of masks that we're ensuring that we have appropriate social distancing, that we're training students on what it means to social distance inside, right? So we're gonna utilize the outside to get them trained to move to the inside. And we understand that after the first nine weeks, we're moving inside the building. Now, if we determine that the current plans we have in place won't work, then we may have to go to a mixed model of which I would inform you about before we do. But I'm we're very hopeful that we can continue with five days a week learning nice. our smaller K-8s and, and that we're hopeful at Rudd, we're moving to four days a week after the first six weeks. But all the data and feedback we receive will determine how we move forward with that. And we're definitely gonna hold informational meetings for feedback throughout and we're gonna continue to survey parents, both in the virtual academy and in, in person, so that if we need to change, we can change to better meet our families' needs and students' needs. Very good. Any more, anything else for Jamie on COVID? Great. Any other business for the board? 
so we have an executive session for personnel. Could could I step back? Sorry, could I step back for one second? And how are we standing with transportation, Jamie? Have we we didn't need to adjust any routes or anything yet? Uh, so no, John. The plan that we put in place was it looked like we wanted to ensure we had the capacity. Right. Without adjusting routes was our concern. Okay. It appears that we have the capacity. What I said to the principals and transportation company is, I want to run those routes for the first month. Okay. And look at ridership. And then we can make some informed decisions if we want to adjust. Okay. I didn't want to adjust now, and then all of a sudden, we find like, oh, that adjustment didn't make sense. I wanted to look at ridership and analyze that for a month. Okay. And then we could meet and make adjustments if it made sense. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Jamie, remind me, are we doing temperature screenings when the kids get on the bus or when they get off the bus at the at the campus? We are doing temperature screenings when they get off the bus. Parents have to complete a temperature check and document that on the health screening form prior to getting on the bus. And then we will do another temperature check after they get off the bus. So the, the bus driver is going to look at a, an iPad or something and say, this kid did did complete the work. I can let them on the bus. This kid did not complete the work. I can not let them on. We the bus. are letting students on the bus. It's a paper copy for this reason because we didn't want bus yeah. drivers looking at an. Yeah, iPad. I yeah, I, I was concerned about electronic and cell cell reception in places. Yep. And so there was other questions. We were going to originally try to do an electronic health form at the building level, and right now we have concerns about connectivity, and I don't want parents completing a health form getting to the school and finding out, oh, by the way, your health form didn't load. <laughs> You're an angry parent, right? Yes. So we're going with hard copies for now. Parents fill it out ahead of time, hand the sheet to the health screening person. Health screening person collects the sheet, takes the temperature, student goes right in. Excellent, thank you. All right. So we need to go into an executive session for personnel. 